Okay. We will be on Zoom. I will be on Zoom Wednesday. Oh. I went to um, two workshops at the nursery this weekend. Oh, good for you. Yeah. yeah. I could not get one of those. Where did you get that? Um, we paid for that when we bought the house, the survey. So I don't, they're not online to my knowledge. No, this is, I just drew this up. So how long have you had your house? Five years. Okay, you should have a survey to walk around with it. Well, when I went to the... I couldn't find my name in the yeah. I went through all my documentation too. This was all they They're not, except one of these. We had to pay them. for ours to get it done. They weren't going to give us one of the house. they gave. I went to that auditor's office there, the county auditor's office. Okay. And they didn't have anything. Yes. I got printed this off and printed this off. So this is all we got. So I just made it up. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, that's how it was done for a long time. And it's so just been there are site surveys, and I couldn't do it. Uh, my house is paid for, so I couldn't find him. You got on a GIS, huh? They have GIS across the whole city, and they well, have, yeah, that's they have the topos and the elevations and the utilities. Oh, yeah, that's an amazing site. Yeah, and it should be pictures of my existing business. Yeah. It should. It should. There's multiple layers. Yeah, there's just multiple, multiple layers. There is. Yeah. It's, it's. And, and then you have to choose get the chat what you want, which I use, and then I just put one on top of the other and just do everything. Okay. I'll look at so, I don't know. Mine might be, you know, more direct. I was having a lot of fun. Yeah, I told you that GIS. Totally. I did. Boss. Yeah, I spent a lot. Yeah, I was. I looked at that. Not happy with that. I found that out the hard way. Oh, really? Because I I use it on. Well, I have an iPad, so. Yeah, it's fine on iOS. Works on my phone, great, but it doesn't work on Mac. Oh, on a Mac, yeah. Yeah, that could that could be a problem. Oh, there's the dealer supposed to bring our third one. Yeah. Yeah, it's a Laramie County interactive mapping application. Yeah, green something. Yeah. And yeah, this is just. Where did I find mine? That's the I may not have even been on that website. Well, I thought the county would have it. Oh, here's where I found mine. Yeah, I have one for my last piece of paper. Oh, sorry. You can go ahead. I was just no, that's okay. Where, where I got it. Yeah. Sometimes it'll give you the yeah the coordinates. I right got there. it at greenwoodmap.com. Yeah, greenwoodmap.com. That's where I got it. Yeah, that's where they actually have everything that you need. <sighs> Yeah, I got that information. Oh, and then they have a satellite image with your current, like 20, they have several, but 20 was the, uh, like, uh, some kind of your favorite. Yeah, that's what I did. Yeah. yeah. And then you just check again. the little boxes for, like, if you want to yeah. low and elevation and utilities improvement. Right, you know? right, flood zone, the whole thing. Yeah. Field. And are you in the development? Yes, outside of town. But outside of town. It's in Larry County. Yeah. 
I'm in Cheyenne. It was really easy to get mine. <laughs> That's hers. County, Wyoming, Matt, certainly. I just I was looking out my window this morning and I'm going, that's where all the shit goes. Sometimes, sometimes that helps a lot. <laughs> Visual aids. <laughs> I'm supposed to turn these in up here? Yeah, I'll put them on there. I'll try Oh, I have a question for you. Uh -huh. My husband wanted to know why manure was not good in the garden because he grew up in Minnesota and manure was one of the things they really spent all the time, all the time. We will cover that in class tonight. Oh, good. good. And Minnesota is not Wyoming. I know. No. That's what I try to tell him. I've been um, in we're Wyoming about years. apples and oranges, especially if I rose in. Can I ask you a question about this assignment? So, am I better off doing one for winter, one for summer? Say, as some of these things are going to be different, so yeah, for shading. Mm -hmm. so it, it, it's supposed to be two. You can if you want, or you can just pack it all on on one one page, or whatever works for you. And okay, because you're the one that will. I don't keep these. I give them back to you guys. I don't. You're the ones that are going to need them, right? Gotcha. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I have a question about um, the views. What is the view? Well, would you like if you had a view where it was a stoplight, a stop sign, or something you just didn't like? Mm -hmm. And so that would be a view that you'd want to block or try to figure out a different sign you would better. Yeah. Like my neighbor's house. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, myself and don't even put my name on it. I didn't the first one either. I had to PDF it to her. Well, the, the important thing, you know, again, I'm going to give them a look, but um, the important thing is that you did it and you figured out how to do it. <laughs> if you're talking about a major yeah. mess, yeah, that's what I got. <laughs> There we go. And I got a name on there. So what layer did you turn on to have your building? I have to enter the address. Right yeah, on that location. Oh, great. Okay. And then there should be a, a screen that has three different layers. And then you have to check it by how you want to do it. I think that's on my screen. Yeah. The greenwood.com. I'm on the site. Here's layers. 
That's what I did now. I don't know what much to help me. Right, but there's no structure. No, I mean, did you find a structure? No, I don't have structure, but I had a survey. I didn't have a survey done. From the data on there. Yeah, I did that. Yeah. yeah. I just overlaid it and then placed it on the Yeah, I might put mine as a talent. You know, yeah. but I had the survey so I could use that as my, you know. Yeah, my last time, Tony and I had in my whole package. Well, yeah, yeah. 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 through all oh, my mortgage, all my title. Oh. Well, did they do an ILC for you rather than survey? The ILC would be showing you, it would show you structures and it shows you approximately what you can do. So it's not in detail. Yeah. yeah, it is. It, it's interesting because some people have a site, you know, a, an official survey when they buy the house that should get one because the the seller has to buy a pay for a survey. Well, ours did. We had to pay for it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Only because I will never buy another property without a survey. After what happened in Colorado, I just won't do it. Yeah. Yeah. I had some friends buy some property in Wheatland and they're like, yeah, they got two and a half acres and I walked it and I went. <laughs> but the owner says it is and, and he measured it. Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> No, I I had a guy that <laughs> yes, I just said you know I just think it's important to know exactly where those corners are and if they're not there, <laughs> so this is I need to know where all the employees are. Oh yeah, in Casper when they when they um, did some expansion, these people had put all these trees on the east side on top of like that outer drive. He now went in and cut them all down because they found them right away right there, and it was a big fight. Oh, it was so crazy. But looking the right away, what do you do? I mean, you know. And and the people, you know, IREA or four now that they're called, they cannot take people to shop now, but technically they could have. Because it says right in the little thing. Like I'm not investing that kind of money we can come in and take it all out. Oh, exactly. We can take it down and it Yeah, yeah. So, I just I just moved my fence along the road about about twenty feet, and I planted a whole row of flowering uh, crab trees. So there's you know moved it back from the from the road and the easement. And I planted my crab apple trees. So I don't think they're going to get it. You know, and there's my power line right over there, and it's like they're safe. They're on the property. They're not like doing anything. And heaven help yeah. the arborist who sets foot and try <laughs> Well, it's interesting. And then you have roots that go down into the easements. And they just come in and put them off. Yeah. My uncle in Texas, they came down with uh, his little ranch. They came down in the middle of his ranch and put the power lines, massive power lines. It's just bisected his little ranch in half. Yeah, it's pretty awful. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's it's very very disheartening. But, you know those big companies. They've got the power of eminent domain and. They're just going to walk in and take. They will take. You know, poor cows. I said, well, you know, I don't trust it. Yeah. 
They had a music dates class with Humphrey's Queen. And she was a very, very, very young. But um, full next year this, this year. They got 2025, but it's this year, and they're going to put a new one in publicly. I sent, oh, yeah, that's what they're going to do. The so, what they're doing is asking everyone to come close to people. Like 28% of their weight as food that can be composted. And that's so easy to compost. So easy. And so their company actually picks up from homeowners on a weekly, bi weekly basis and makes the compost. And then in the spring, they return compost based on how much they pick up. Wow. But she was. Really, you know, of course, I wanted fifty dollar discount, so I was even happier. <laughs> and a good thing the weather was in your favor. It was in my favor. I saw one, the orchestra, one I think the Audubon president, Wanda, oh, Wanda Manley. Yeah, yep. and she was she had gone to the class before me, so we were like, our husbands are on the, the phone bugging us about weather, right? I said, well, I think we're good for a while. Yeah, the other one was landscape design, and I had met her before. Was down in Denver area, I think. She was a really good. But then, so it was where I am. I did stay way too much planting yet. I just get all the more soil and that or um, my file's gonna come with um, fertilizing trees in mid March. Okay, that's uh, tiger because Matt wanted to spray three times for fungus. Yeah, I told him I had an I said, and I'll be pulling that stuff out of the and it would be really hard on me for a constitute, and I said, my family, I just can't have that. No. And it's so unnecessary. So, so unnecessary. So if I lose trees, I lose trees, but I don't lose my health. And right now I'm glaring at the end. So, I so what kind of trees did he want to spray? Um, all of them. Were they evergreen trees? Yeah, and and the yeah. And so, Kyle came in and I talked to him and he said, well, I, he said, I think what we'll do is fertilizer and water, water. And then I've got a guy coming in to see down the entire sprinkler system. Let me put one inch pipe on my drip and my trees. Yep. And I can hook it to the whole if I want to. Oh, okay, great. great. Thank you. That's going to be my plan for this year. Just keep it in that yard. And then uh, maybe the following year, I'll send a grant like that. I think it's kind of the middle of the pile. If they respond to that free treatment, I like biology. You know, I think he and I have a lot of the same philosophy. So is he going to just do like soil injections for fertilizer? How is he going to do that? Do you know? I think he's going to do soil injections. Yeah, then he wants to be there with just on the rock. I think I want to do with your so I think that's what we're going to need that once they blew it and butt out and stuff to take another one and just do one over. Okay. And it's more of a step by step. We know they need to realize it. That's obvious. And, uh, does injection so I have to spray? I don't spray, I inject if I don't spray. Anyway, he says I need to have a way around and a way to see. So I, I paid, oh gosh, I paid with 
And I only take the prime Yeah, that's understandable. That's so my my whole approach with this class is very organic and no chemicals or you know, don't spray unless you really know that you've got to spray. And and then even if you see insects, you know, why are they there and what's causing them? And, and let's let's try to fix the cause instead of spraying the sign. No, what's what's the let's go back. I have fungus down in in Don't worry about it. No, yeah. You know, I don't know. There's a lot of different. I gotta fix the one that pissed me off. Yeah. Oh, the other thing Wanda said is um, Rex will come and hang the grass, grass, big grass on any of those like bad mold areas. Mm -hmm. I, I have seen, you know, maybe, maybe I'll get the little, I don't know, I was just going to use my fertilizer thing and put the seed in there and turn up the Real thing. Maybe overseed. It's really hard because the timing is really tight. Okay. And and a lot of times if you just yeah. overseed them, they're gonna feed the whole birds. They'll just feed the birds. Okay. And they'll just get all the right up. Yep. So you really have to drill seed it in your uh, conservation district has a toe behind the seeder. That's what she was talking about. Yeah, and left, and you've got to use that toe behind and, and drill that seed in and then make sure it's over here. And April is your window. March is your window. Yeah, I think that there's someone at the conference on the fourth. I kind of forgot and he's going to be talking about this on the board. Yeah. I only have, you know, the west side's the only bad part. Is that going on the gap? Here, and I'm going to look at it when you guys are going to take it home because I don't need to. No. All right, well, good evening, class. We'll get going here. Um, the, the weather <laughs> looks like it might be a little iffy but going into Tuesday. There's a winter weather advisory starting Tuesday evening at 5, going until Wednesday to 5 p.m. So watch your email, and I'll let you know, because that next class will be vegetables. And it's really easy to take that one online and, be, and just do it via Zoom. And that's really easy. In fact, I brought I brought my teaching tools for that class, which is my which is the Johnny Seed Catalog, because I teach out of this. And so everyone will take home a Johnny Seed Catalog tonight, just sort of being proactive in case we can't have class on Wednesday. You know, I don't want you guys out driving if you don't have to. And I'm way out in Carpenter, so. We'll make it easy, and it's easy for me to do this on Zoom. Okay, so this this class, again, my whole approach on class is this the program is to be as as organic as possible, and to be use integrated pest management. So integrated pest management is always where we start with the least toxic, and we work our way up from there. And I like to take a holistic approach to gardening. And I want to look at the whole part and how it all interacts together. And so that goes right down to the so adding, amending soil and working with the soil because healthy soil 
is going to give you a healthy plant. It's going to give you a more productive garden, yard, trees, whatever. And, and so we start with how do you actually amend the soil? And so there's a lot of myths and there's a lot of stuff out there that is just kind of snake oil. So I want to cover some of the snake oil stuff out there. And then I want to, and then I want to introduce you to some things to amend your garden with that you probably would have never have thought of using. That's very organic, very user-friendly, and very benign. So our growing season can be, there was one year where it was 80, 88 days. So 90 days is kind of pushing it. Last year, we had kind of a funky growing season, and it did go to 140 days. It was hot. <laughs> and, and so it was, it was a difficult summer in that respect. <clears throat> Typically, we have very cool nights, which the cool nights really slow down the growing, especially in a vegetable garden. And then in about every 10 years, we have a severe drought. And 2002, we had a severe drought. 2012. 22. Um, last year, yeah, by September, we only had five and a half inches of moisture. By the end of the year, we had something like seven and a half inches. In, an, in a sort of normal year, it's anywhere from nine to 15 inches. 15 inches is a really good year. So we're always in a drought. And for a lot of you who are from back east, Minnesota, Michigan, down south, you know, you get your water is like 36 to 48 inches of water. You get a lot of moisture. So for us to only get 15 inches, that that's difficult. And a lot of time it's only like five one hundredths of an inch at a time. So it kind of gets metered out a little bit to us. And I will try to show. So a year ago. A volcano erupted in the South Pacific over by New Zealand. And it was a very unique volcano in it. It was an undersea volcano. And it threw up lots and lots of water. And I'll I'll try to find that video and get it up so that we can watch it. Because it was it was different. <clears throat> Most of the time volcanoes are throwing ash into the air, which is cooling, but this volcano threw moisture into the air. It threw lots and lots of water into the air. And that water actually caused kind of like a magnifying effect. And it's what caused our summer to be so hot. If you read some of the popular press, they will firmly blame it on human. It's people, it's a people problem. No, it's a volcano problem. Last year was a volcano problem. In any given year, at any given moment, there's about 50 volcanoes out there erupting or doing what they love to do, which is putting stuff into the atmosphere. So when you see purple sunsets or purple sunrises, that's actually volcanic ash that you're looking at. So I'll try to bring that, that volcano thing up because that's really quite fascinating. So that's why we had such a hot summer. Blame it on a volcano. <laughs> Watering. I see a lot of people, and I think California right now is a really good example of it, where they've had a drought, but they've been watering their lawns, but not their trees. And so their lawn, their grass on their lawns is a couple inches thick. Well, what do the tree roots do? They come up to the surface, right? And they're looking for water too. Well, they've got these amazing pictures of these beautiful trees that have come out of the ground. And it's just because they weren't watered deeply. They're just watered, watered shallowly. So when you water, watering deep is a lot more important than, than making sure they get a sip every day. And I run into a lot of people who just give their trees or their lawn just, just enough every day to keep them going. It'd be better if you can, you can train your bluegrass lawn to be drought tolerant. When it comes to watering deeply and having had that soil amended well or knowing how to go back and help that soil. But the, the deeper you can water, the better and the consistency is really important, especially in something like a vegetable garden. So soil, and we will cover soil a lot more in depth with Brian Sebade's class, but soil is air, water, 
decayed plant residue, organic matter, mineral, sand, silt, clay, and then a whole bunch of microorganisms like bacteria and fungus and a whole bunch of other things. And so the soil is a very, a very active universe. But all of these things come together, and this is what makes what makes the word soil tilth. A soil tilth just means that you can actually grow something in that soil and that it does well, it thrives and it survives. So more than 1 million organisms in a single teaspoon of soil. And I know that just sounds fantastical that it's really like how much could be in there, but, but they've done enough research on this and enough grad students have had to like measure all that stuff under a microscope that they know that that stuff lives there. And if you go to the soilhealthinstitute.org, they will certainly talk a lot more in depth about it. So you only want to work the soil when it's dry. And for, for us vegetable gardeners, that is really hard because come March and it's a warm out and you're wearing your t-shirt and it's like, wow, this is beautiful. I want to start getting going on my garden and you go out there and you put a shovel in there and the soil is wet Re or it's damp. Resist that temptation to work that soil when it's wet. When you work wet soil, you cause compaction and you end up with a net loss of organic material. Anytime you work the soil, you need to be adding something back to it leaves, pine needles, grass clippings, but you should always be adding something organic back into the soil. We talked a little bit about this, soil salinity, which is a measure, which if you do a soil test, and you get the get it back, they'll have a, a thing that says EC or electric conductivity. This is really, really an important number to know. When I look at a soil test, the first thing I look at is what is the pH and what is the soil salt? What is the EC? And then I look at a couple other things before I go back to NPK. But soil salts should be low. When you start adding manures to your soil, so this is part of answering your husband's question. Manures are very high in salts. I have cattle and I have sheep and I've got a big mineral tub out for them all the time. I have salt blocks and they're always on those. So what goes in comes out the back end and if they've had to be on any sort of medication, that's going to come out too if I've, if I've warmed them. They're, they're only absorbed so much. And then that all comes out the back end. So you're putting all of that back into your garden, that salt. And so manures are classified as hot, right? I mean, you hear that term, they're hot. They're hot because of the salts. And the salts are what going to burn the plant, burn the roots of the plant. And they actually don't so much burn the roots, but they, they pull the moisture away from the roots and cause a physiological drought of that plant. And so the plant grows and grows and as the lower leaves start turning yellow, pretty soon it wilts and you water it and this goes back and forth and then the plant just finally dies. That's, that is a salty soil that does that to you. Vegetable gardens, the only time you should be putting salt with your vegetables is when you eat them, okay? <laughs> but, not, but not before. So we do measure salts, and again, salt, you can run a current through salt. And so that's how we measure the salts and soils is by that resistance. So a non-saline is going to be two or less, and it's millimoles per centimeter. And the higher it gets, the bigger the number, the more salty it is. And if your pH is also high and your salts are high, you have the worst of both worlds. And trying to overcome that is really, really difficult, if not next to impossible. So be very careful with what you put into your vegetable gardens or your flower beds. 
And then there's a salt index. And so the numbers are all over the place. Um, sodium nitrate, that's 100 on the salt index. So that's as bad as it gets. So, so all of the, well, potassium chloride, you're not ever gonna use potassium chloride, but, but you can find potassium sulfate in the stores. And so just be careful and know that these fertilizers, these minerals can be very, very salty and that they're not benign. They do have a downside or a dark side to them. And that's if they can raise the salts or they can add salts back to the soil. Okay, rototilling. <laughs> so I have a big, a big uh, tri-built rototiller and my husband gets a hold of that thing and he just loves to go and go and go with it. And, and he, he's only allowed two passes and that's it. Because the more you till the soil, the more you break down that organic matter and the more air you add into the soil and the more you lose that organic matter. So you, if you out there and you're like, I want it to be just perfect. I want it to be, you know, this, this fine looking like Iowa type soil and you rototill about a dozen times, you have just lost all your organic material. So you've done more, you might've enjoyed the workout, but you've done, you've done uh, more harm than good. And it's better to, you know, if you're gonna add stuff like leaves and pine needles and straw and your kitchen scraps in there, it's better to still be able to see some of that because the worms are gonna take it down. The earthworms are gonna find it eventually and take it back down. And it's de gonna decompose pretty quickly. So, so no sports rototilling, <laughs> two passes. So, Liming the soil, that is a back east thing. And if you live west of the Mississippi, you're looking at the pH, which is gonna be very acidic. And so you add lime to raise the pH so that the plants can do well in it. Well, the big box stores still sell lime out here because people ask for it. And so, well, we're gonna sell it, right? They don't care. If you have, even if you've got horses, baking soda is a much better thing to use than lime because baking soda is not going to cause, not going to burn the horse or the animals in the barn or lime will. So <laughs> you don't want to ever lime the soil unless you want to make a real hard compacted surface. So when they do road construction, they will make a lime slurry and add it to the sub base of a road so that the road compacts better and makes for a harder, more resistant surface when they put down the road base on top of it and then put asphalt on top of that. So don't, don't turn your garden into a road. Don't make bricks. Our soils, our soils are already high enough in lime, which is also calcium. So we have plenty of that. Sometimes it's just not bioavailable and, it's just, and it just has to do with the pH of the soil. So that's where you add peat moss to, or sulfur to lower that soil. Wood ash, fireplace ash, barbecue ash, that again is a back east thing to add that stuff to your soil. And you, yeah? So if you added those to your garden, how long would it take to compost out of it? <laughs> <laughs> I may have done that last year. <laughs> Well, it depends on how much you've added and how much you rototilled and and what you planted and what grew. But don't add any more. <laughs> so so here's the deal with with wood ash. When when great 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 grandmother made soap, mm -hmm. she ran water through fireplace or wood ash, and the water that came out was lye. And lye's got a pH of fourteen, so yeah, so it's extremely alkaline. And and you really don't. We fight the pH as vegetable gardeners to begin with, so that's 
that's a big reason to not add it because it will mess with the soil pH. A little bit goes a long ways. It's got a lot of micronutrients to it. I mean, it does bring a lot to the party, but it does bring that pH thing with it too. So, what would I amend it with this year last year? Well, that's what we're going to cover tonight. <laughs> okay. You also want to be careful with lawn fertilizers in your vegetable garden because they're when they switch from lawn fertilizer to weed and feed fertilizer, the quality control is not always there. And so you really risk having an herbicide in that fertilizer. Even if it's kind of a little bit, a little bit does a lot of damage. Okay, so here's my big soapbox on manures. Don't use them. Don't put them in your garden. Just say no. Every spring, you're going to see an ad in Traders or someplace, free horse manure, come get it. You know, it's in the corral. It's, it's, been, it's been composting for a year. No, no it hasn't. <laughs> it's been sitting in your corral for a year, but you haven't truly composted it. So again, manures really don't bring a lot to the party other than they do have organic material and they can add add to that tilth, but they've got the salts with them and they have a whole bunch of other unknowns in them. I mean, you don't know what the NPK is. You don't know what the nitrogen is. Nitrogen typically is gonna be pretty low, but they also bring weed seeds. Horses are the worst as far as weedy manure. If you wanna inoculate your garden with weed seeds, horse manure is your answer. <laughs> But the, the other problem with manures, and especially, and I've had people say, oh yeah, the, the neighbors to the back of me have got cattle, so we just go through the fence and pick up cow pies. Okay. <laughs> Whatever makes you happy, right? You can't, I wish you could use them for frisbees too or burn them. But they, they also have a lot of pathogens and parasites with them. And so, for those of you who are doing community gardens, do not put manures in your vegetable gardens because of the E. coli risk, the salmonella risk, the campylobacter risk. And, and so you've got to be really, really careful with the manures just because of those pathogens. I have never seen anyone out here really truly compost manure. And you've got to turn it and turn it and add water and turn it and you have to keep working it and you need to be turning it every 10 days. And even then, I'm going to tell you, just throw it around on the prairie. Don't put it in your vegetable garden. It's just, it, you're going to have problems. And if you've got a high tunnel or a greenhouse, you're going to turn your high tunnel or greenhouse into a Petri dish. So you've got to be really, really careful with that. Back east, you can get away with putting this in the ground because they get enough water, they get enough rain that it just flushes all that stuff below the root zone. Out here, it just sits there. And, and I've seen some just biblical salt problems. And after I told some friends of mine, do not put manure in your high tunnel. Do not rototill that manure in. Oh, they did. And he ended up having to, having to just put hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of gallons of water on the soil to flush it. He didn't add enough water and the soil dried out. And as soon as he started to water it again, the capillary action brought the salt back up. And he said the inside of his high tunnel just sort of glistened and sparkled with salt. Mm -hmm. so, so what do you do? You know, remove the soil or remove the high tunnel. So you're not gonna fix that problem. You're not gonna fix the salts. So be really careful with manures. I, I think the pathogens and the parasites alone are enough to go on the... Okay, getting off my soapbox. Okay, organic matter, really important. Comes in a lot of different forms, but it improves the buffering capacity of the soil and it keeps the soil from overreacting. So, so we're, <laughs> you've added, fireplace ash to your garden, I'm gonna tell you to add more organic material. So that can be like leaves, grass clippings, straw, kitchen scraps, coffee grounds, 
for all the coffee drinkers in here, you know, I grind my coffee. I have a nice little filter, have a huge bowl of it, and I amend my soul with it. Coffee grounds are just amazing in the garden. The organic matter also is going to support that soil microbiology, and that is just so important to have that, that healthy, biologically active soil. And the only way you can get it is to keep feeding the soil with good, good compost, non-manure-based compost. What about pine needles? I love pine needles. <laughs> oh yeah, pine needles are amazing. I mean, not only do they smell good, but they break down really quickly. And so the myth, the myth on pine needles is that they cause the soil to become acidic. Total 100% myth. So, and then people go, well, nothing grows under my pine tree. Well, of course nothing grows under your pine tree because there's no sun getting down there and it's in the shade all the time. And so that's why, that's why plants, your grass doesn't grow under a pine tree because it's too shady, but don't ever, ever limb that tree up because now you've changed its center of gravity and you've exposed its roots and you've made that environment hotter and drier. So you wanna leave those pine boughs all the way to the bottom, leave the pine needles there. Or if you do rake them out in the spring, put them in your vegetable garden or put them along your flowers. I mean, they make a great mulch and they break down really quickly, really fast. Mm -hmm. Okay. So organic matter is gonna improve the tilth. We've talked about that. It improves the condition of your soil, the soil structure. It's gonna hold more water, it's gonna hold more nutrients. So it's just going to be more beneficial with organic matter. You don't need a lot. Two and a half percent is, is on average what we see. And that's actually a good number. You can get more in there, but, but two and a half percent is really what you wanna to try to target for. So, that organic matter helps convert insoluble natural additives into plant usable forms. And again, you're feeding the soil microorganisms, they break it down, it's a slow release, and it helps your plants deal with stress a whole lot better. So organic matter should provide adequate ground cover to prevent, prevent soil erosion. And last year, I saw a lot of soil below, a lot of, a lot of below dirt, especially off the prairie. Should have a high rate of nitrogen fixation and good biomass production. So that means that it's holding nitrogen, it's pulling nitrogen out of the air, and there's a good ground cover. So there's grasses growing or flowers are growing or vegetables are growing, but there should be good ground cover. So the downside, this is the challenging part. You need 460 pounds of organic matter for a 100,000 square foot garden to raise the soil organic matter by 1%. Mm -hmm. so, so vegetable gardeners are gonna be the crazy people that try to chase this one along with soil pH. So I, I, we're always looking for something to add back into that soil. I've got, um, I've got oat straw right now that I'm gonna be putting into the soil. Um, <laughs> One year, one year we processed, my husband and I processed 200 chickens. I don't, I don't recommend that. But the, <laughs> but the byproduct was feathers. I had lots and lots of feathers. And I amended every one of those feathers into the soil and into my vegetable garden. And it was, it was just amazing. Just amazing. So if you had that old feather pillow, feather down vest, whatever, don't throw it away. Just compost it. Sit. It breaks down really quick. Okay, so we talked about soil pH. Seven is neutral. And milk is actually slightly acidic, about 6.6, 6.5. Wine, all the way down to four. Lemon juice, two. Vinegar is at four. Vinegar is at 5.5. .5. And then on the other side, you have baking soda eight and a half, ammonia, 11. Lye is actually eh, 13 to 14, it's top of the scale. So vegetables especially, gonna want it down in that milk range. 
They want, they want their soil slightly acidic. So peat moss, soil sulfur, those sort of things are gonna help you. They're not the total answer, but they're gonna help. Okay, those soil microorganisms. Again, some poor grad student, some undergrad student had to do this. So nematodes, which are microscopic worms, there's good guys and bad, bad nematodes. You can actually buy good nematodes to go after your bad nematodes. Fortunately, we don't have a lot of that sort of problem here with bad nematodes. Um, algae, if you have fungus gnats in your houseplants, it's because there's too much algae in your soil, the houseplant soil, and the fungus gnats are feeding on that algae. So the answer to that one is to water less frequently, let the soil dry out a little bit. Protozoa, fungi, acetomycetes, bacteria. So it's, it's packed with just an amazing universe of microorganisms that are all trying to break down stuff that you put into the soil, hopefully things that are organic material. And they, they break it down, they feed it back to the plant. It's a very slow release process. So it's not gonna be that instant type gratification, but it's a lot better for the garden. So they, again, transfer that organic material and incredibly important in that soil fertility. And so when you, if you hike out onto the prairie and you're, and you're looking at the plant biome out there and you'll see, you shouldn't really see areas where there's exposed soil, but when you do find that exposed soil, it's pretty much dead, a dead area of land. And that soil needs to be covered with something or something needs to be growing on it for it to be a healthy soil. So as soon as that's a bare soil, that's just, hard, very hard to bring that back. So soil microorganisms also help the soil with water holding capacity and that soil erosion, which is so important to try to prevent. Okay, soil bacteria. These guys, this, this is a pretty interesting area of research and a lot of it's already being worked on and done. You can buy all sorts of different types of soil bacteria. And as a vegetable gardener, um, you want to buy rhizobium. And you can get them in little packets. And, and we'll get more in depth with this in the vegetable class. But it helps the, so it helps the plant with nitrogen fixation. So it, it, it forms on the roots of the plant. The plant actually feeds this rhizobium and in turn, it's a very cool symbiotic relationship. So the plant feeds the bacteria, the bacteria is grabbing nitrogen and feeding it back to the plant. And there's a lot of vegetables that don't do well without this rhizobium relationship. Soil fungus. These guys are the decomposers of the world. They'll decompose just about anything and everything out there. And very important to have in your soil. I'll get phone calls in the spring about mushrooms in my lawn. And what, what the homeowner is seeing with mushrooms in their lawn is just the tip of the iceberg. A little mushroom and they're like, yeah, I went out and I picked them all. Did I get rid of them? Yeah, no, no. Because it's like that iceberg. It's, it's the monster living underneath the ground that you don't see and you can't control it, you can't kill it. There are no, there are no poisons to go after a fungus. Fungus is almost impossible to kill because the spores, and so this is important for you, because, and this is why the guys in Colorado said don't bother, because trying to kill a fungus is, is almost impossible. They have a new set of chemicals out there that are kind of working, but they're 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 way up there. Right? They're not a homeowner will never get a hold of them type thing. So why are they hard to kill? Well, fungus forms a spore, and that spore has a, a hard shell on it, a chitin shell on it, 
And so the, in, the fungicides can't penetrate that. They just, fungicides just sort of erode away and decompose and go away. And then under favorable conditions, the fungus spore germinates and it's off to the races. And then it reproduces more spores. And so this goes on and on. And so you will just never get the upper hand on a fungus. You can, you can try. There are some other products that are pretty benign that you can do. You can take baking soda and mix it with water, two tablespoons of baking soda and a gallon of water with a little bit of soap, just a couple drops of soap. And you can suppress the fungus. And then there's also safer soap, which is actually an insecticide, but it works beautifully on fungus and it just suppresses the fungus. So that's all you will ever be able to do is suppress a fungus. Okay. Again, fungus decomposes just about anything in its path, puts the nutrients back into the soil, back to the plant, binds particles. So this, these little thread-like things are the soil of the fungus, the mycorrhiza fungus. And again, they live in and along the root zone of the plant. They have this cool symbiotic relationship. They've evolved with plants and they, they help increase that plant's ability to take up nutrients and water. They cannot survive long in bare soil conditions and they can't survive in in, in conditions where chemical fertilizers have been used a lot. So like, I'm gonna pick on miracle Grow a lot. And if you've got miracle Grow, don't use it on your vegetables ever. You know, use it on your petunias, use it on your lawn, but keep it out of your vegetable garden. Don't put it on your roses. And so, the chemical fertilizers are pretty hard on the soil and the soil microorganisms. Okay, so we talked about NPK, which again is nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And, and then there's also these micronutrients in the soil, calcium, magnesium, iron, boron, manganese, sulfur, uh, the, there's there's about 15. The debate is how many do plants really need? So the debate is anywhere from 15 to 17. So when you do buy a fertilizer, read the ingredients. All that marketing fluff on the front cover, ignore that. Just ignore it. Turn it on, turn the box and look at what's actually in it. Look at what the NPK is. Look at what the micronutrients are because a lot of these plants, especially sulfur is needed almost as much as nitrogen is. And a lot of these plants have micronutrient problems, especially come July. I see a lot of problems and, and sometimes they're hard to diagnose because insect problems, soil problems, micronutrient problems, they, they can all look alike. So it can be really hard to diagnose plant problems. I usually rule out insects unless I see them, but I look at the soil and where the plant is actually located. If it's up against the house, like a foundation plant, I'm gonna blame the soil because that, that concrete foundation leaches back into the soil and it raises the soil pH and that ties up the nutrients. So the pH and these micronutrients are closely related. And the higher the pH, the more it's gonna tie up micronutrients. When you start getting back down to neutral to a little bit acidic, that's when a lot of these nutrients become bioavailable to the plant. So another reason not to overlove your soil with things like fireplace ash and... <laughs> but, well, well, as we go through this lecture, you'll figure out a way to fix your soil. Wait, it's, just a minute. I wondered about rototilling. You said, you know, limit how much you rototill. How do you like to work soil? Do you work at all, or do you shovel, or undercutter, or what do you what do you like to do? Um, in my big garden, 
uh, we'll make two passes with the rototillers. My big garden is is um it, it's about three thousand square feet. That's my big garden. Um, it's my potatoes and sweet corn garden. I just wrote it. I just my husband gets two passes with the rototiller, and I have better have everything laid out and ready for him to rototill. So I'll go in and, and head of him, and I'll layer stuff. I'll layer all sorts of crazy stuff in there, and then he'll rototill that in. Because I don't want that soil to work. How deep does he go? Uh, eight inches. Eight inches. Yeah. He's gotten older. I don't know how that happened, but um, so now he gets in the tractor with a big rototiller attached to the tractor. So I really have to monitor him. <laughs> the little, uh, my little high tunnel, I will actually can turn things with a shovel. And so it gets, it gets turned once. I've got organic stuff there. All my kitchen scraps are in there. Um, lemons, orange peels, all of that stuff, um, coffee grounds, filter and all, that's all gets turned under. And then I just rake it smooth. Just, I, I do it once, rake it smooth. And I know that soil is, is very bioactive. It's got a lot of microorganism in it. And within 10 days, it'll all be gone. It'll all be broken down. Yeah. Even lemon peel? Oh yeah, oh yeah, all gone. Oops. They even if they've been on the surface and they're dried out, yeah. So you put in like the permanent cores and everything whole. Yeah, sometimes like broccoli stuff, like tonight for dinner, I made green beans and so I cut off the end. Yeah, you would just throw that in. Oh yeah, absolutely. I have a bowl that's next to my kitchen sink, and so all of that stuff goes in there. You know, like then carrots, you know, lots of peels. Yeah. So I take peelings, I throw it in the compost bowl. Um, I peel potatoes, I don't. So all that goes in the compost bowl. The lemons, that goes in there. Everything. So you don't have a compost area to turn it and all that. I, I just don't keep it growing. I, I just, I just throw it in. And we'll talk more about it because I can pull compost. In. So we'll talk more about it. I, I, yeah, keep my, I keep my uh, life as simple as possible in my garden. Okay, so again, read read that that bag, bottle, whatever. You know, it's like even there. This thing has got an ingredient list on the side. See what's in it. I don't care what the front. I don't care what the marketing fluff on this front says. I really don't. What I care about are those three numbers, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, NPK. I want to know what the micronutrients are. That's all I care about. For a while, well, I think they still do. I didn't look too much yet last year. But anyway, Menards, for whatever reason, thinks that we can grow azaleas here. And so they sell a lot of azaleas in Cheyenne. They also sell azalea food, plant food. <laughs> slash fertilizer. So when they call it plant food, it's also, for, it means fertilizer, interchangeable. But the azalea fertilizer is some of the, it's got the right numbers and the right formula on the side, the right micronutrients to help aspen trees when they start to turn yellow in the summer. I mean, it's, it's just perfect. So I tell people to go buy azalea fertilizer to use on their aspen trees. So don't don't let and kind of marketing is just crazy in the horticulture industry, and they they have you thinking or believing that you need a special fertilizer for your violas and a special fertilizer for your geraniums, you know, one for your petunias and. And, and I want you to buy all that stuff, right? And then spend all your time micromanaging your plants. And it's it's crazy. You know, if you get if you can find a fertilizer in the stores that is somewhere in this range. So there's your nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. This is kind of my one size fits just about 
everything. And if you can find, don't, don't pay any attention to what it says. If it says it's for geraniums, who cares? This is what, these are the numbers that are meaningful. 5105, that's kind of that, that middle range that's gonna help, but not hurt. Or make your own fertilizer. We've already talked about that. Make your own fertilizer. That just, that just simplifies things and makes it a lot easier. The alfalfa pellets are going to have some micronutrients, not much. If you really want to get geeky and tweak it and be the geeky master gardener, then we can talk more about your father Joseph's going, yeah, I want to be that geeky person. We can talk more. Um, so when, for, when Colorado um, made marijuana growing legal, all these shops popped up to help people grow marijuana. And, and so they're, they're actually fun places to go because they speak my language and now they speak <clears throat> your language and they sell some great fertilizers. And you can go in there and you can custom make you, what you want. And so I'll go down there and I'll buy you know, some soluble potash and I'll get something like something else, but we all speak the same language. So it's a lot of fun for me. The people are a little in a different universe than I am. But, <laughs> um, I, my, my feet are on the ground, they're not. So, <laughs> but they're fun stores to go in. I mean, you just <laughs> take it with a grain of salt. Okay, so nitrogen. There, you definitely have to have this, especially in your vegetable gardens, because it helps phosphorus work. And it's, it's there to help a whole bunch of other functions for the plants. Growth is the big one. You know, nitrogen is gonna tell that plant to grow and to grow a lot. It's gonna tell the roots to, it's, it doesn't tell the roots to grow and keep up with the rest of the plant. And the problem with too much nitrogen is that it's going to make that plant really soft and succulent and very inviting to insects, especially aphids. So too much nitrogen, and this is a big problem on roses for the rose growers in here. You're always fighting aphids on that plant. It's because you've over fertilized, too much nitrogen. If you back off that nitrogen, in fact, I wouldn't even put nitrogen on a rose. I would just work with um, phosphorus and maybe a little bit of potassium and I'd leave the nitrogen out of the element just so that I'm not getting insect pressures. Because then what do you do? Once you get aphids, then you go to the store and the clerk says, oh, you need this insecticide that has nitrogen in it. So you're on this roller coaster that never ends. So be careful with that. Always read that, always read that bottle or bag. Nitrogen does not, is very mobile in the soil. It doesn't stay put. So the problem with that, where it doesn't bind to the soil, it binds to water. It loves water and it will bind to water in a heartbeat. And so when I see people fertilize in April, March, thinking they're getting ahead of the program, or they're, for, or they're going, it's going to rain, so I got to go out and fertilize. Well, it's all binding to the water. And it's even if it gets driven into the soil, it's still going to follow the water. So it gets into your groundwater. It runs off into the gutter. It ends up in creeks, ends up in lakes. And it's not something you want to be drinking. And, and it's not something you, you want in your groundwater for sure. <clears throat> but it does bind to water. So that's, so if you've, if you've fertilized just before a rainstorm thinking you're ahead of the game, you've just wasted your time and your money. And now that, now that's all gone. Got some master gardeners that are with the DEQ, Department of Environmental Quality. And so they monitor groundwater among other things. And they, they talk about dealing with a guy in Lander who 
was spraying miracle Grow on his snow. Wasn't trying to get his snow to grow, but he was like banking that fertilizer so that it would be there by golly in the spring. Yep, no. <laughs> that, was, that was a tough one. Um, and depending upon what nitrogen you're using, it can either make the soil more acidic or more alkaline. So again, again, this is why, you know, make your own fertilizer, you know, be a little more organic and all natural on that, but you can manipulate the, the pH with, um, with your nitrogen. And the uh, anamonical is usually the one that will lower the pH and had a salt test come back from a guy in Cheyenne who was using that on his lawn. And he managed to push his salt pH down to like six, which, you know, it's okay. Okay. So this is my, my soapbox and nitrogen. It doesn't evaporate in water, it just stays there. Oh, yeah. Phosphorus. Oh, sorry. So what would you suggest would be the best source of nitrogen instead of using some high stuff, like say worm castings or anything like that? Yeah, worm castings will work. What, what are you trying to fertilize? Oh, just, you know, basic garden. I mean, I, I don't know. I guess it all depends on what you're growing, right? Yeah. And again, I would make your own for, for a vegetable garden. I really encourage you to make your own fertilizer. If you're doing a lawn, there's there's a whole bunch of other things you could do for your lawn. Um, corn gluten meal, 10% nitrogen. So all natural weed and feed. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, just sprinkling down alfalfa pellets and then getting them wet so they break down. Rabbits will leave them alone. So there's a whole bunch of other really organic ways to treat a lawn and your trees without having to resort to chemicals. I, I'm just a geeky enough vegetable gardener that I'm gonna make my own. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. Vegetable gardens and alfalfa stuff is all you need for fertilizer? For vegetable garden? Yeah, and we'll talk a bit about that tonight too. So are the pellets or the powder better? Does it matter? You're only gonna find alfalfa and pellets. Okay. I don't know if you can, I brought some pellets with me. Oh yeah, I see them. Yeah, I can see them. Okay. Cool. Did you get those at Tractor Supply or somewhere like that? Uh, so, I buy alfalfa pellets in the super sack, so I get about 1,800 pounds at a time. But um, you can get these at Tractor Supply, Murdoch's, um, ANC Feed, All Around Feed. All of those guys are going to carry this stuff. But yeah, you want you want the pellets. You don't want the the cubes. You want pellets. Because okay. this has been dried, ground up. Perfect. Can we go back to the marijuana growers for a minute? So we sell them gas that they use there. I believe it's nitrogen and CO2 mix. Mm -hmm. So obviously the nitrogen. Where does the CO2 come into play? So the CO2 is incredibly important. And in they're it's most likely in a greenhouse that they're doing that. And so they're they're pushing, they're they're pumping that greenhouse full of CO2 so that that forcing that plant to photosynthesize more than it would naturally. And so it grows more, grows faster. And I and it produces more of what they want. Yeah. <laughs> Is that good to force it like that though? What's that? Is that good to force it like that though to grow about it? It's all about production and the money. Whether it's good for the plant or not, it's so relevant. 
anytime you start getting into commercial greenhouses, whether it's carnations or roses or any of those, they're going to pump that greenhouse full of CO2 just to bring, just to keep that photosynthesis going. And a lot of times when it's an enclosed greenhouse, they have to do that because there's not enough air, outside air circulation coming in. And so they'll, they'll pump CO2 in there. Yeah. And plants can take up nitrogen through their leaves. So they take it up osmotically. So they can do that. Yeah. Yeah. So Colorado people are coming up to buy this stuff. Well, I work in Advent, so I. Yeah. Colorado, Wyoming, all that area. Yeah. So we can put something that will our gas pipe or our fuel pipes on our cars and sell it to the projects. Ah. <laughs> Doesn't quite work that way, but okay. <laughs> Um, and to be too great, I teach the part number I believe is nitrogen and to be great. Yeah. 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 There is some. The amount of fertilizer that they sell in the grow shops is just amazing. And, you know, it's all sorts of funky stuff with weird designs on it. And I mean, just, but, but again, they, it's like they talk. The right language, you know, they talk NPK and soil micronutrients and and the growth and photosynthesis, and so that's a it's a very fun conversation for at least me. My husband just rolls the eyes and walks out, <laughs> takes a take, you know, and I always have a big bowl of candy out on the counter. <laughs> so, so it's it, it's it's just where you're wherever you want to get your entertainment, right? Okay. Phosphorus, so that's this number, this one here, that middle number, essential ingredient in all cell protoplasm, fruit set, flowers, root growth, very, very important. So when you plant a tree, phosphorus is one of those things you want to kind of amend into the soil a little bit so that that's there, so that the roots grow. You want good, strong, deep roots on your trees. Does need nitrogen to work. Nitrogen helps this helps hand this off to the plant. Needs a pH of around six to seven. So it likes a little more acidic to neutral. This, this is kind of the couch potato of nutrients when it comes to the soil. And it doesn't move, it doesn't do anything until your shovel tells it to move. So it just stays put. Or if the wind blows it away, otherwise it just stays put. It does move from old leaves to new leaves, so it's it's following that growth curve up. Soil moisture and temperature is really important, and the same thing with nitrogen. So I'm going to go, I'm going to step back to this guy for a moment. Nitrogen needs soil temperatures of about 65 degrees for the plant to take it up. So if you're putting nitrogen down early, or you're spraying your snow, it's I, I just still think that's hilarious. She didn't think it was funny at the time. <laughs> but it needs, nitrogen needs 65 degrees or warmer. So the plant can actually take it up and use it. If it's too cool out, the plant just doesn't know what to do with it. It's just too cool. Also needs to have some soil moisture. If the soil is dry and you've, and you've, gone through and sprayed your lawn, you know, sprayed a dry lawn, it, it, again, the plant just can't take that up. Same thing with phosphorus. And phosphorus will increase the soil pH over time. So you've got to be careful with it. So for us vegetable gardeners, that's something that we watch, we should watch closely. Because vegetables want their soil more acidic. Too much, so too much, what does too much mean? Um, anything greater than about 20% is starting to get to be too much. Too much is gonna cause vegetables to be bitter. Same thing with nitrogen, too much nitrogen in that soil. So this is why I pick on miracle Grow. Because the miracle grow, especially the tomato, is 
is like 18, I think it's, I think it's 10, 7. But this, this causes just a whole host of problems with tomatoes. It might work back in Ohio, back east, but it's really the wrong NPK for Wyoming for the West. And you can bake phosphorus. So phosphorus will just gonna sit in the soil, right? Because it doesn't move. It's sort of the couch potato of nutrients. And it you could still have some left over for next year. So you do have to be a little careful with this one. Compost and vermicompost are gonna be your best sources for phosphorus. So vermicomposting is, is using worms and for for a while, worm composting was a really big thing with the master gardeners. And it was kind of like, if you didn't have a worm bin in your house, why well, you just weren't a master gardener. <laughs> okay, not phosphorus is not a renewable source resource. We do, we do mine phosphorus here in the United States, just not a lot, but most of it is gonna come from North African, country of Morocco, some areas of um, the uh, Middle East. Potassium or potash, that's this last number here. So I, I, I've heard it called potash. And the first time I heard of potash, I, I had to snicker and my girlfriend just about clopped me. But it's called potash. And it got that name from the American settlers who produced potassium carbonate by evaporating water th filtered through wood ash. So you're talking about high pH. And the ash-like crystalline res residue remaining in the large iron pots was called pot ash. That's how it got its name. Used in making soap. Uh, okay. Potassium is important, which, but keep in mind that it's got a very high pH to it, and it's also very, very salty. That said, it does aid in photosynthesis, so that makes it very important. Activates more than 60 enzymes in plants, helps retard crop diseases, increases protein content of plants, so it makes it more nutritious. Helps potatoes, helps that yield on potatoes, gives potatoes that firmness, that internal color helps potatoes be more resistant to diseases. And tomatoes, if you've got tomatoes that are kind of orangey and they should be fire engine red, it's most likely a lack of potassium and a plant can't take up when you use potassium. But again, caution on that, on using it. You don't need it in big numbers. That's, that's about where you want what you want to be careful with is when you see fertilizers that are like 20, 20, 20, or 10, 10, 10, kind of like the, the shotgun approach. So this, it just makes the fertilizer a little scary because of the salts and the pH. So again, read that box, bag, label, See what's in there. Make, make sure that it's really something you want to be using on your soil and on your plants. Also for, for vegetable growers, if you're noticing that your tomatoes aren't the right color, adding that to the soil is too late. And you actually need to get a foliar spray version of it and spray the plants with it. So, and we'll get into a little more detail on that with a vegetable class. Okay, 
So I want to take a little bit of a break here. And then we'll get into some of the stuff I find on the market and some of the stuff to avoid and how to how to further amend your soil with some cool stuff. But uh, again, uh, tea, coffee, weird snacks. If I just bury my vegetable scraps, is that good enough or do I have to actually till it? I just bury them. Okay. Yeah. And, and we'll talk about that in the class. Because I don't think my peels break down in 10 days yeah. okay. <laughs> or anything breaks down in 10 days. Okay. Like, well, we can work with that. And, okay. Yeah. And then do you go to like, do you recommend a hydroponic shop down in Fort Collins? Like I've been to Way to Grow mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, because I have a couple of arrow gardens yep. and I've been getting into like hydroponics sure. a little bit, but I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> No. Yeah, that's been asked about that too. Yeah, because I don't know what I'm doing, so I go there and I'm like, "Can you?" I do semi hydroponics. Can you help me? And they're like, "Well, what are you growing?" And I'm like, basil. <laughs> <laughs> so like, look like a three step hydroponic system. Right. If they have the nutrients listed, I'm doing a three step, and I add all those together. That's that's my total nutrient, right? If you add all the numbers, or are you checking the are you checking the water for pH and buffering capacity? I'm checking the pH because I noticed the city water used to be almost like I call it plant happy, the five point five to six point five, and then for some reason it changed and it went all the way up to eight. So then I had to start doing the pH down. Right, the city water is eight point five. Yeah, because I don't know why it was. It was great for a while, then all of a sudden it changed. I'm like, what did the city do? Um. The city really isn't doing anything one way or the other. Right. I mean, they're, they're just trying to keep it clean and safe. Right. And it, that means it's going to have a higher pH. Like, I'm glad I was checking it, but it was just, I was just curious because, like, if I have extras left over, I'm like, can I go throw it out on my trees or in my, my sure. garden? And I added them all up and it was, it was a little high on the potassium. That how it work? You add them. You add all the. That that's what I'm assuming. <laughs> I add them all together on my three step system, and that's my total nutrients. Because I'm using them all together. It's yeah. like I don't even know what to ask them. Like I go to the hydroponics shop, and I'm like, so like this. I one, want nutrients for my arrow garden. <laughs> like this one is. Everything you grow is going to take a different fertilizer. Okay. So you can't grow tomatoes in the same solution you do like basil lettuce. or something. Right. And you can't do lettuce in the same solution you would do in herbs. Oh, so even they, though they're just leaf, leafy things, not those really. leafy things might need less calcium. Uh, tomatoes are going to need more. So it's it, it's complicated. It's not a one size fits. It is not one size fits. But it is really complicated too, especially like if you have house plants, you have to think they all have to be different as well because some are blooming, some are not. This is why I only have, have Christmas candles. <laughs> everything else. Is... Well, now I'm rethinking my whole my whole setup. Yeah. So hydroponics is, is tricky and you've got to really monitor that because the, the water, city water is going to fluctuate a little bit by the pH. Sometimes it might also be a little bit more calcium. Right. Something else might be a little out of balance in the water. So you've got to constantly water monitor what comes in right. down to the right pH. You've got to make sure that it's it's at the right buffering capacity and it's your EC isn't too high. So there's a lot of things to, to monitor. It's just not a one size fits all world. So if you go to grow yeah. Colorado, you've got to say, I have an arrow garden, I'm just growing herbs in there. Right. And I'm looking for the fertilizer that goes with the herbs in my arrow garden. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'm not convinced that the, the LED lights on those arrow gardens are right. Yeah. Because they, they haven't changed what they're doing. Right. 
And they have fixed, to a certain extent, the LED light spectrum. Yes, yes. So that's another component. So, so hydroponics is complicated because of the lights, solutions, yeah. pH, yeah. EC, buffering capacities. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, yeah. But you have basil in the winter. Yeah. <laughs> which is nice. Yeah, which is nice. Yeah. Yeah. Because when I bought it, it came with like, you know, here's the fertilizer, this little bottle. It's like you just dump it in and, you know, let it grow and whatnot, right? And then I ran out from the fertilizer and I'm like, this is really expensive. And so the, we went to Fort Collins and we went to the hydroponic store and it's like, I have an arrow garden. <laughs> Please help me. Everybody gets theirs back because I don't. Well, all I had was my subdivision map, so I created my own. It's got the scale. That's right. I'm just going to hand it there. This is really more for your. Yeah, so, so I don't know. Yeah. It's tricky. And in a search, you have to add more water. Now you change water yeah, so I'm kind of lazy about it. So I just I fertilize it every two weeks, and then I add water whenever it looks low. And I mean, I get herbs, which I like, but I feel like I'm not very. It's not like at all. And then when you get into the bigger, bigger hydroponic growing systems, I mean that's that's science now. Yeah. Well, it's not it's not casual gardening right that's like you've got to monitor all aspects of it right so yeah. i certainly enjoy it i have basil right now growing it's lettuce it's really nice <laughs> and it's nice to look at and it's fun but i definitely don't think i will optimize yeah. this system at all yeah <laughs> yeah if i did a class on hydroponics you guys would just kill me <laughs> I, I would um <laughs> you would just kill me because it's so dry. It's so cut and dry. It seems like the pH has to be this, the EC has to be this, yes. the X amount is. And you should be monitoring that every day. Oh, really? Yes. Okay, so I'm not monitoring it at all. Yeah. 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 You should have your pH strips. You should have an EC meter. You should have, you should actually have a pH meter, not just the strips. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you should be just really science okay. oriented. There's no I feel like I'm doing lazy hydroponics at this point. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's and that's the problem is is as soon as it gets to that point where it's I want to do it, but I don't want to put the effort into it. That's where you start having problems and things don't grow right. Or you know, I walked into a, um, someone trying to do hydroponics here in Cheyenne on a commercial scale, and I walked in and it's like, yeah, it's like they had house plants in there. And it's like you got house plants out now. Okay. Yeah. That's not compatible in a hydroponic system. So it should be clean because once you get insects on those plants, they're doing commercial. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to get rid of those aphids or white flies. <laughs> okay. I have a question on this assignment. Okay. <laughs> this is what I got from the map, and that is about as helpful as nothing. Right. So I I drew my own. Okay. 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 As, and as long as you feel comfortable with how how it worked out and you found the, um, where the shade is and the, and the spots and cold spots, that's really the important part is finding all those micro plants. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that it can help you be better at planting and gardening. Well, I think part of the problem is this. it's not overgrown, mm -hmm. but it is. I mean, whoever did the, the, the design for this did a beautiful job, but I'm not doing as good a job keeping everything going. Yeah, water features are. And it's a very big one. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. 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 And I mean, the water plants themselves are taking over and. Yeah, they have um, bulrushes or cattails. No, I don't have cattails, but I do. I actually don't know what they are. I know that the rhizome root of them is huge. 
and they just keep growing and growing and growing. And I mean, and I have a lot of native grasses that were, you know, ornamental that were beautiful to begin with. And I feel like they've just overgrown everything. And I don't know what to cut back and what to <laughs> mess. I mean, it's so everybody who comes and sees it goes, oh my God, this is a botanic yard. And it is, it's beautiful, but it, I'm not maintaining it. So in order to do all this, it would be better to get to go to, to Google Earth and get a proposal. And again, it's to help you better manage your yard. Okay, that's and then um, just like, so I, I, I'm in the health profession. We tell people what websites to use and what not to. What websites do you recommend we look at for good advice on, I mean, or, or those, I guess the counter would be to avoid. Are there any websites you prefer gardening wise? I just go around. I always make sure those sites that you can use. Okay. For that university. Because yeah. okay. anything else is going to be on you know, box. Whatever. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Is there an easy way to get a hold of uh, I said Michael Heath has a lavender farm? Actually, my mom. Is there an easy way to get a hold of him? Um, does he have a website? He does not have a website. He has an email. Okay. And email, email me back. Okay. And then I will send one. I thought I had sent that stuff to both of you, but email me and remind me. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, yeah. So this is uh, now I got it the next day. So I think I explained that a lot. We actually just so I'm sitting in the library. So this is yeah, I'm tapping. So, Oh, I have to do this. I'm going to have to do this. I think I'm going to get this one out. I'm going to start off with the Oh, yeah, we'll see if we get it from us. Good question. They turned up, trying to pull the snow down. My husband, my husband, my husband, my and so, yeah, Mark, back on the sleep part. We put home from the kitchen. Yeah, it's not the And so, yeah, she, there's a reason. Yeah, she does the right. We bought it, and then we're like, oh, you're welcome. We had the slate, right? So none of this was my design. This was in the band. But you know, this whole thing was really Oh, yeah. I have a there is yeah, because we do that. Okay. Okay. So I'm just going to do this. Oh, we just don't. Oh, Oh, 
A lecture here, and I'm handing out this bulletin from Colorado State University on organic fertilizers. And this is what the rest of this lecture is going to be based on: is um, some of the research that they've done on what's out there available in the world. So the rest of this lecture is based on stuff that I've either found at the stores or found in catalogs or something that someone brought to my attention and they go, yeah, I just came back from Utah. I bought all this azomite or I brought all this ligonite back with me. And it's like, okay, why did you do that? So we're gonna talk about this and how it works and some of the things to avoid. First thing I'm going to tackle is urea. And the chemical plant just to the west of us, Coastal Chem, does a lot of. Did we run out? We have enough. Did everyone get one? Okay. We can go over there and get urea from in a yard call a number of years ago where someone had done just exactly that. Urea is just pure nitrogen, 46%, they put it down on their lawn. Mm -hmm. Then they called me about two weeks later and said, my lawn is infested with ants. So they had managed to make their plant so sweet and succulent <laughs> that they ended up with a lot of aphids. And they ended up with a lot of ants and a whole bunch of other problems. And, and so there's nothing you can do about it. Don't, don't start spraying for the ants because that's, that's futile. The, the only way to kill off ants is to kill the queen. And, and there are some really benign ways to do that. There's those little ant bait traps. Uh, aspartame comes in the little packets called Equal. You take a little packet of Equal and you sprinkle it on the ant hill or where the ants are traveling, those little sugar ants, the little tiny guys, you'll get rid of them overnight. It was it was originally developed as an ant poison. It did trust me. It it took a lot of digging to find out the basics why aspartame came to the mount to the market, and. It's there if you dig deep enough. <laughs> it's also incredibly sweet. It's cheap to make, and so it's a sweetener. But it's also a great ant poison. Work on red ants. It it just primarily works best on those little sugar ants, the little tiny guys. The ants that are the black and red guys, the harvester ants, the harvester ants really aren't causing any problems. They're just part of the ecology. And they, they kind of help till the soil and move stuff around. And, and so the harvester ants are those guys that build those little volcanoes out on the prairie. Those are harvester ants, part of the ecology. Just ignore them. They're all right. They're not hurting anything. They're helping you. Anyway, urea. So... You want to, if you if you do get the hold of this stuff and you do want to use it, I strongly suggest that you really cut that rate way down to about a fourth of what they recommend, so that you're not overloading and forcing you're forcing that plant to grow. You're not feeding the soil. You're not doing anything positive in that respect, but you're forcing that plant to grow. It also creates a little zone of toxicity. And so if there's a seedling trying to grow, you know, if you just put lawn seed down and you go, God, I got this bag of urea. Let's really get things going. Yeah, you just killed all, of, all the little seedlings. So it also, nitrogen also volatilizes, 
So if it's not trying to run off with water, it's turning into a vapor. And so it just evaporates into the environment. So there's a lot of ways that nitrogen likes to escape and not do its job, which is help the plant grow. So I, I go for the, the little, little is better than a lot of nitrogen. Another product that I run across is rock phosphate. And it sounds really good in the magazines or big box stores. It's like, oh, it's an all natural form of phosphate. Well, it needs a more acidic soil to work. And if you put rock phosphate down, it pretty much just stays as a rock. Same thing when you use bone meal, it really should be ground up finely. So if you get bone meal, you should put it into like a mortar and pestle and grind it a little bit more into a fine powder so that it can break down a little bit more. But again, it's very pH dependent. If your soils are alkaline, it's just gonna sit there. There's all sorts of other ones. There's a colloidal phosphate. And, and again, it's, it's pH dependent and most of the time it just wants to sit there. So phosphate, phosphorus, which is really important for us vegetable gardeners, is a real <laughs> tricky one. And so it helps that the soil might be a little bit more acidic. So I like to use peat moss because peat moss has got a pH of around five and a half. So I just amend peat moss in there. I'll use a little bit of soil sulfur and, and that helps that phosphorus do its job. Okay, potassium chloride. Again, we talked about this guy, very salty. Wants a pH of around six to be, be usable. Kelp. No. Over the years, my bag has kind of fallen apart. Okay, I'm gonna pass this around. This is kelp, and it is exactly what it says. I've used quite a bit of it in my gardens over the years. It does have a tendency to be a little salty, so you want to be careful with it. It provides more than 70 minerals, micronutrients, plant growth regulators, vitamins, hormones, enzymes, natural supply of chelated minerals. The NPK is really low. It's 1% nitrogen. So not a lot there. That's not what you're putting it in for. You're going for those micronutrients, those vitamins, those hormones. So about a, a pound of kelp to a hundred square feet. I've used it, I feed it to my sheep. It's, it's expensive and it's hard to find. When I do find it, I'll use it by, it comes in 50 pound bags when I do find it. Produced out in Oregon, Washington, Northern California. It is just dried ground up kelp leaves. Really nice in the garden. It is a little salty, so be careful with it. Coffee grounds, pH of about 6.9. I, I think it depends upon the coffee itself. I think it could actually be a little bit more acidic, depending upon what you're grinding. Carbon to nitrogen ratio. So this, now we're talking more about how it decomposes and you want that carbon higher than the nitrogen level. So it's gonna decompose pretty, pretty well but it does bring a lot of stuff to the soil. It, it adds a lot more to the soil tilth. It helps acidify the soil. It adds airspace to the soil. It breaks down pretty quickly. And I've been able to turn around some really bad clay soil with coffee grounds. Filter and all, the whole thing goes in there. Don't worry about the filter, it, it goes away. It doesn't blow away, it just, it, breaks down and gets incorporated. <laughs> Nitrogen, about one and a half percent, no, no phosphorus, potassium, don't even worry about it. So it doesn't really bring a lot. It doesn't bring a lot of NPK to the, the program, but it does, it is organic material. And so you're now adding some great organic material back into the soil. 
Starbucks about 6.30 in the morning puts out their yesterday's grinds. They know that there's crazy gardeners out there that get up at the crack of dawn, right? I have been known to bring coffee grounds home when I do conferences if I'm driving. Bring home, brought home about 20 pounds one, one year for a conference. Yeah. So they're, they're readily available. We got a lot of coffee shops here in Cheyenne. So be a geeky gardener. And, and for, you know, when, when you do a church service and you have the fellowship afterwards and they're, that's a lot of grounds, even the leftover coffee that's not consumed, that should all go into your compost. Yeah. Stuff is like garden gold. Yeah. I don't know. It breaks down pretty quickly. Depends upon how much coffee you drink or, or in that early bird, you can snake the big bags at Starbucks. You know, I spread it out, till it into the soil. It does need to be tilled into the soil. You got a compost pile going, add it to the compost pile to keep that going. I usually just put it straight. I so I do cold composting, and I know I talk about it in the lecture. So cold composting is kind of like lazy composting, mm -hmm. but it's, I have a lot of critters that want to help me compost things, and so they'll steal stuff out of my garden. So I bury it. So I just dig a hole, you know, here's my soil. I just throw everything in there, coffee grounds, orange peels, lemons, whatever. All that stuff goes in here. And then take this soil and I put it all back in. I just take my shovel and I just kind of push around a little bit and then I dig another hole and away I go. So this is cold composting. I am feeding the worms. So the worms come along and they go, oh gosh, she's feeding us again, thank you. So they take all this stuff and they make worm castings out of it and all sorts of good things. And, and then they feed the microorganisms. And so I have a very biologically active soil just from doing cold composting. I have composted tea towels, t-shirts, and blue jeans, and socks. You're kidding. No. Can you compost those? Can you cut them up those smaller? I don't know. I just got a big hole and I threw the blue jeans in there and covered them up. <laughs> I haven't even found this ever. So I'm going to find them. Yeah. 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 And so if your soil is active enough that you can compost a pair of blue jeans, that's cool. Yeah, have you come across any uh, research or anything dealing with caffeine and coffee grounds stimulating the microorganisms at all? I, I don't think anyone's done any research on that, to be honest. Yeah, I I, I've never seen anything on that. And, and I just drink decaf coffee, so I'm not, I, I think it's just straight organic material that they're working off of. Yeah. Yeah. So with the cold composting, so the, you throw everything in here, you put the dirt back over. You never actually go digging down looking for that stuff to spread it around on yourself. You just use the worms and spread the love around. Yeah, that's all I do. So this is primarily my vegetable. Mm -hmm. I'll do it. My father does check that room. Let's get the bags. Or if I'm trying to make a new follow bed, then I'll do it in a new follow bed. But this is this is pretty much my my vegetable garden. So that is in your vegetable garden. Yep. yep. I do all I do all year round. If I'm growing vegetables, there's a space in there where I can I can dig a hole and throw in the ground and in my compost bowl. But I'm just constantly and slow release. It's a slow release food. Does it spread? I don't spread it. No, my does it spread? I'm just I mean, unless you plant something right on top of it, what does it do? 
Well, I'm still feeding the soil and I'm feeding the, the worms. And so the worms are moving around. And I typically can come back 10 days later and not find anything, including my citrus peels. Yeah. Well, you know, plant right on top of some of it too. Slow release. Yeah. So let's say, talk about the flower beds because I do a lot of flower gardening. Um, and a lot of times I just throw stuff out in the garden, especially in the wintertime. If the rabbits and everything don't get it, right, <laughs> it's right. eventually going to find its way down into the soil. We have tons of tons of worms. Yeah. And so the worms, tons. the worms like cool soil. And so the worms are more active at night. And so in the summer, they're more active at night. They'll actually come to the surface, they'll find all that stuff, and they'll pull it back down. Yeah, there's some cool videos on that. Okay, so banana, do I put banana peels in there? Yeah, they, they break down really quick, banana peels. Yeah, yeah, and it's and so there's a lot of myth on some of that stuff. It's like, well, my plant needed more potassium, so I put banana peels in there. There's no research on that. You're just adding some good organic material on there, and it's like eggshells. I'm adding calcium to the soil. Yeah, probably not. It's not in a bioavailable form, but you're adding organic material to the soil, and that's the important thing. Yeah. Are oyster shells pH dependent as well as colonial? I suspect so. Yeah, because Wyoming soils, Western soils are already high in calcium. But a lot of it just isn't bioavailable because that English. So lowering the pH, heat loss, easiest way to do it. Um, there's a couple other ways to work it. Soil sulfur. That's too bad James isn't here because he's he's had a lot of sulfur to get his blueberries to grow. <laughs> This is what soil sulfur looks like. I do so I do use soil sulfur when I'm in my soil, when I the, my big garden where I grow uh, my potatoes and my corn and some of the other stuff, my winter squash. So I'll spread that out, I'll sprinkle it out kind of lightly. I don't move it, put a lot in there. <clears throat> I have a I have a sandy soil, and so that's a cold soil. And typically cold soils or wet soils are gonna have sulfur deficiencies. And the soil tests coming back kind of indicate that that is, is a true. Sulfur is needed almost as much as nitrogen in as big quantities. And it helps with enzymes, and vitamins, chlorophyll, um, plant growth, the ligands. So it's, it's, it's really needed. But again, you know, I've, I've cautioned James or blueberry grower, that that too much is going to make it make the soil toxic to the micro microbial soil life. So you've got to be careful with that. And so a little goes a long ways. So a little is one to four pounds per hundred square feet. So not a lot. And you should put that on earlier in the spring so that it has time to break down and become available to the plant. So you can't put your garden in and then put sulfur in because it by the end of the season, then your plants will be able to use it. So you can see if your soil is at a pH of seven and a half, you want it to get to six and a half because you're a geeky vegetable gardener. You're going to need to add three cups of sulfur, soil sulfur per hundred square feet. So that's actually quite a bit. But again, vegetables want their soil more acidic. So where you're doing the community garden, this might be something to really look at. I go down to Eggfinity in Eaton, Colorado, and I buy it in a 50 pound sack. Because it's cheaper. If I go to the big box stores, they're gonna sell it in a one pound bag for the same price that I pay for a 50 pound sack. Cottonseed meal. I put this in because one year, one of the nurseries in town 
was selling cottonseed meal. And it was like, well, really? Where did, where did that come from? You know, we don't grow cotton here. Cotton, cotton needs 250 days to grow. <laughs> We're not even close. So I go down to Eggfinity, which is a farm and ranch co-op in Eaton, Colorado, and I can buy this in 50 pound sacks. So thank you for that. <laughs> so go ahead and, and look at it, feel it. It does bring quite a bit to the party. It's got 7% nitrogen, 2.5% phosphorus, 1.5% potassium. So it doesn't bring a lot, but it does bring some, and it's a slow release, all purpose fertilizer. It's not very expensive. It will help lower the soil pH. Not sure how it does that, but it, it is good for doing that. Potatoes, roses, any acid loving plants. So instead of putting manures on your roses, go down and put some cottonseed meal on there instead. And so cottonseed meal is the byproduct from ginning cotton. So this is sort of the, the junk that's left over. And a lot of times in the South, they'll actually use cottonseed meal incorporated into animal feed. So not sure what it does for the animals other than high fiber, maybe. I don't it's know. Dairy cows. Yeah. Protein. Yeah. There's got to be some protein in there. It's got to be something. So the downside of this is that you need anywhere from 10 to 15 pounds per 100 square feet. So you do need a lot. I don't necessarily put that much out because I don't want that much. I don't want that much nitrogen because I'm putting other things in my garden. I don't need 7%. So I probably do half that rate and spread it out. Okay, some other myth busting here. Gypsum. If you're adding gypsum to the soil, you better have a really good reason the need to add it. And if you've gotten a soil test and this and what's called the sodium absorption ratio, which is a combination of the sodium absorption rate is where your pH and your EC are both really high. And the ratio has come out to 13% or greater. If you've got soil that's got that, you've, you've got a big problem and gypsum is the answer. But that's the only time you should be adding gypsum, which is calcium sulfate to the soil. They will sell it at the big box stores it doesn't mean that you should be adding it to your garden. You really should have a soil test to determine whether or not that's needed. So caution to that. Lime, don't, don't add lime to your soil. You can add it to your driveway. If your driveway is soft or you're having problems to drive, add it to your driveway because it'll firm up that driveway a lot. Okay, my other favorite one, Epsom salts. I get a lot of people that say, well, I planted my tomatoes and I added Epsom salts to them so that I could prevent blossom end rot because that's a calcium problem. Well, Epsom salts is magnesium sulfate. Epsom salts have nothing to do with calcium. In fact, too much of this will tie up the calcium and not make it available to the plant. So keep Epsom salts out of your vegetable garden. It's not needed. If you've got blossom end rot problems, the first thing I'm going to ask you is how are you watering your vegetables? Because blossom end rot in Wyoming, in the West, is a function of water management issues. Peat moss. I'm going to tell you to use peat moss for your vegetable garden or your flower beds. If you're putting in a new lawn, put down peat moss. This is going to help absorb and hold water in the soil. It's going to bring that pH down. Your trees are going to be a lot happier for that. 
So it, it brings a lot to the program. It's gonna add body to sandy soils. It's gonna help break up clay soils. It is a great type of a natural compost, non-manure compost to add back to the soil. So for vegetable garden, this is really kind of the first line that I go to. If you're really geeky about your vegetable garden, then, then I'll work with you and we can play with it and we can really do some cool stuff to get that production way up. <clears throat> Humates. Boy, for, for a while, this was just really the popular thing. And you can go down to Grow Colorado and they'll sell you Humates. They'll sell you all sorts of things. But humates are developed from decomposed prehistoric deposits found in the Western United States. So it's, it's kind of like not quite coal and not quite peat moss. It's somewhere in there. And not a lot of research on this stuff, but boy, it gets a lot of that stuff gets sold. And humates come in the form of, of humic acid, ulmic acid, and fluvic acid. And, and again, you can buy all this stuff and they think this is what some of it does. They think that the humic acid enables plant to extract more nutrients from the soil. You know, just have a healthy soil, have good microbial activity in your soil. Omic acid stimulates and increases root growth. Not a lot of research on that. Fluvic acid, there's all sorts of kind of non, eh, kind of weird research on fluvic acid. Helps plants overcome stress. That describes most of the trees in Wyoming, stressed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if fluvic acid is gonna help them, but there it is. Fish bone meal. There's also fish emulsion. I'm gonna pass this around. This is this is mackerel. <laughs> yeah, and also this other stuff, it's like, yeah, go ahead and open it. Feel it, sniff it. And I don't open that one. So fish emulsion and fish bone meal, dried ground scraps of fish, you know, for the a lot of the fish farms. They'll make fish emulsion and sell all that byproduct as a fertilizer. So, you know, the, the guts, the fish poo, bones, all of that stuff, it's all just ground up and turned into an emulsion. I like to use it. I think it really brings a lot to the program. And when I make my fertilizer, when I make that alfalfa tea, I will add that to it. Just don't get it on you. Don't spill it on you. <laughs> Blood meal. Blood meal is, is fairly high in nitrogen and it's very soluble, so it goes quickly. It's, it's a fast release nitrogen. So you do have to be careful with it. And so this is a little bit goes a long ways. So 12% nitrogen, 2% phosphorus and not even 1% potassium. So it's not very salty, but in this case, this is hot. And so you wanna, whatever the rate is on there, you wanna do like, like a third of that rate recommended on, the, on that bag. Bone meal. This is now a steamed product. So they kind of cook it before they release it. It should be ground. It's usually not ground well enough. So you might want to grind it a little bit more so it's more of a powder. Otherwise, it just stays as a little bone fragment in the soil. Soil needs to be more acidic for this to be taken up. So you should be adding peat moss to the soil if you're going to add bone meal. Very slow release, very slow, like a couple years type slow. So this would be something that'd be appropriate to mend the soil with for a tree if you wanted to do that. Or you're putting in a new lawn, put bone meal down so that it's a slow release phosphate and so that it stimulates, keeps that, those roots growing. 
soybean meal. Again, you can go to the, the feed store and buy soybean meal in a 50 pound bag, five to 15 pounds per 100 square feet, 7% nitrogen, 2% phosphorus, 1% potassium, very slow release. You work it in prior planting. Again, you can feed your lawn this stuff. You can incorporate it into the soil for your vegetable garden. You can feed your flowers. This would be another good one for roses and just flower beds in general. Corn gluten meal. This is sort of the all natural weed and feed. Professor back in Ohio or Iowa State University, um, Dr. Christians kind of stumbled on it when he added it to a strawberry patch and he discovered that the corn gluten meal naturally suppressed weeds from, they germinated, but they stopped growing. So it was kind of killed that weed at the germination rate. The problem is that it's, you can't put it in and then try to seed your garden because it'll kill anything. It's not exclusive to just weed seeds. So if you're going to put corn gluten meal down, you go back in and you plant oh, carrots. Yeah, they're not going to grow. Corn gluten meal lasts about four weeks in the soil. And that depends upon how much moisture you have in that soil. So if there's not a lot of moisture, then that corn gluten meal is going to stay longer. So you kind of have to plan in advance how you want to do this. And so this is great for lawns. You can put it down in the early spring to suppress weeds from germinating. And you can put it again down in the winter to suppress your winter annuals from germinating. Or it's not gonna stop them from germinating, it's gonna kill that germinated seed, that little seedling that's sort of. All natural, 10% nitrogen. So if you wanna go totally organic for um, your lawn, about one pound per 100 square feet, so you don't need a lot. I know ANC feed downtown sells it. I don't know if all around sells it, but, but you can try those two. I don't think you're gonna find it at Tractor Supply or Murdoch's. Probably you can go down to Agfinity and eat and then pick it up too. But pretty cool, all natural weed and feed. Grape pumice. So if you're growing grapes, and you are extracting the juice from the grapes, that stuff that's left over, the stems, the seeds, the peel, everything, that is, that is a great soil. It's right up there with coffee grounds. It's gonna slightly acidify the soil. It's gonna add a lot of organic material back. It's pH of three. Wow, I mean, wine is acidic, but this stuff really helps your soil. So you're adding up natural organic material, natural compost back to the soil. NPK 312, so not very high, but it is bringing something to that, to that soil to help it. I don't know if you can go up to Table Mountain and get their grape pumice, because they do produce grapes and make wine up there. But I kind of look at whatever comes out of the garden can go back into the garden and help the soil. You know, whatever comes out of the produce aisle at the grocery store, you know, the leftovers, the peelings, all that stuff can go in my compost bowl and can go back into the soil. All of that stuff is recyclable. Feathers. Feathers are cool. I, I don't ever want to process another 200 chickens ever again. But, but I had the best corn crop ever when I when I plant, I put all those feathers back into the soil, rototilled it in once. I mean, you can see feathers popping up all over the place. <laughs> plant, yeah. Put my drip down, planted my corn. And that corn was some of the best I've ever had. Best growth, best everything. It was a very slow release nitrogen, 11 to 15% nitrogen. That's, that's the only thing that's in the party there. They just bring nitrogen. But nice slow release, really nice. And breaks, it, break, it broke down very quickly. By the end of the summer, I couldn't find any more feathers. 
just couldn't find one. I had a, an old feather pillow. <laughs> I gotta tell you, if you have an old feather pillow, the kindest thing you can do to it is compost it. Because mm -hmm. that was an eye-opening experience. Um, <laughs> I just I opened it up and went, ooh, and just dug a big hole and buried the whole thing. <laughs> Yeah. What's that? So anyway, it, just about if you can think about it, almost everything is recyclable in some way back into that garden. <laughs> Ten to fifteen pounds per thousand square feet. So a little goes a long ways. A little goes a long, long ways. Okay, alfalfa pellets. For those of you who don't know what alfalfa pellets look like, so not a lot of nitrogen, phosphorus, or potassium, so they don't bring a lot. And and this again, this is why I like to use these kind of natural approaches because they they don't overstimulate the plant and make the plant grow in a manner that's not natural. Because as soon as you're forcing that plant to grow, you're, you're going to have insect problems. You're going to have bug problems for sure. Five pounds per hundred square feet. And you can just scatter it on the lawn, water it in for the lawn. Um, again, there's, there's a whole bunch of alfalfa tea recipes out there. The um, American iris, for, um, Hosta Rose Societies, they all use it. Um, University of Lincoln at Nebraska has done research on it. The Soul Food Web with Dr. Elaine Ingham. So a lot of work on that. High in vitamins, calcium, magnesium, other micronutrients, has starches, proteins, amino acids. Um, again, your roses. So I'm, I'm trying to take the manure away from you and putting manure down the roses. Alfalfa pellets will work. Water them so they break apart and soak in. So on your lawn, you would just throw them like they are in that bucket? Oh, yeah. I'll just scatter them around water. and water it in. Yep. And the same thing, you know, with the corn gluten meal. Slow, it's all slow release. It's all slow release. And so when you start using these more natural kind of organic approach, it's not instant gratification, which is what the miracle, which is the whole premise behind miracle growth is instant gratification. And, and that usually is at the expense of the plant. Green sand and granite dust. This, this is, you can find these in some of the, seed catalogs where they're going to sell this stuff to you and very slow is probably doesn't even describe it but you have to take it and we grind it and make it a fine fine powder and even then it's probably questionable as to whether it's going to be used by the plant or not and it's a source of potassium so this is something that a tomato grower or a potato grower is going to pursue. But again, it's a lot of work. You're going to have to grind that up. And it's slow release. And it needs a more acidic soil. So sugar. Good old sugar. That's in that alfalfa tea recipe. Is that sugar? And the University of Lincoln, University of Nebraska at Lincoln, Dr. Elaine Ingham, just plain white sugar that's kind of changed over the years. Started off with molasses, which was getting expensive and hard to find. And then we moved to corn syrup. And now it's just like, just plain old sugar, just plain old sugar. You're feeding either the bacteria or the fungus in the soil. So depending, a 3% solution, you're going to be feeding more bacteria, which for vegetable gardeners, uh, green beans, peas, that's where you want to be. For the rest of the garden, herbs, that sort of stuff, more fungal. I, I don't, I, I don't, don't worry about that. Just follow the recipe, throw the sugar in there, stir it all up, and uh, feed your soil with it. And the soil will figure it out. 
plain white sugar. Find the cheapest stuff you can find. Go to the dollar store and get cheap sugar. We'll spend a lot of money on this. Okay, mushroom compost. Just, just say no to mushroom compost, okay? Just say no. Mushroom compost is horse manure and sawdust. It's, it's a total unknown. You do not know what the NPK is and you don't know what the salts are. The pH maybe, and the pH is gonna be driven more by the, the uh, sawdust than anything. It varies greatly. High insoluble salts, very high EC. So you, you again, you don't know. It, it's kind of like opening up the back door and saying, saying to the biker crowd, yeah, come on in, join the party. Yeah, no, you, you don't, you just really don't. Be careful with this stuff. Okay, animal manures and organics. The NOP, National Organic Program is very persnickety about manures in any cropping system. And it's like a 90 days. You know, if it's, if you're adding manure, you know, alleged compost manure, it's 90 days before you can harvest. Well, we have a 90 day growing season maybe. So trying to bring manures in and meet those rules or even for your own safety, because again, um, E. coli can live in, in, in cow manure for a year. It, it doesn't die, it stays in there for a year. And listeria, the same thing. Listeria loves, loves a high, you know, loves a, a very acidic environment. It doesn't care about the temperature. It can survive all sorts of things. And listeria is sneaky because you don't know you have a listeria problem for three to four months. And then you're sick and then you're going, I don't know why I'm sick. And then the doctor doesn't know why you're sick either. So you gotta be really careful with these animal manures because they're, I just don't look at them as being safe. And then there's the parasites. If there's eggs from a parasite in there, there's no guarantee that that's gonna be killed in the composting. If, that, if you don't know if that compost has gotten to 140 degrees and stayed there for the whole 10 days at least, I guarantee you those parasite eggs are still alive. Okay, getting off my soapbox. Okay, goes without saying, if you do use manures, wash those vegetables really well. <laughs> okay, sawdust. Um, it, it breaks a lot of organic matter to the program, a lot. And if you're trying to bring organic matter into there, this is, this is what's gonna do it for you, is sawdust, wood shavings. They make a horse bedding pellet, but just be careful with it because they have binding agents in there. And, and you're not really sure what those added chemicals are. The problem with sawdust, is that you're gonna have the microorganisms, um, the, the rhizobacteria in there is gonna, is gonna attack that and just grow exponentially. And so that sawdust in the soil is actually gonna heat up in the soil, your soil will actually get warm. And as long as there's a food source in there, it's releasing a lot of nitrogen. But as soon as you run out, as soon as those microorganisms run out of food, they die and it drops just in a straight line. And then that's called denitrification, where you actually start having a net loss of nitrogen and you can see it in the plants. So you have to understand that if you're gonna use wood shaving, sawdust, know that at some point, like within two weeks, you're gonna have that rot. And so be there with something like, like soybean meal or cottonseed meal or something to reincorporate into that soil so you don't so your soil doesn't die off. Because otherwise you lose your microorganisms. So does this also pertain to wood chips on top and the back of the gardening? No, nah, not really. Because the wood chips usually stay up there and it'll slowly decompose and the worms go up and mess with it. 
So wood chips, I don't ever really worry a whole lot about. It's when you've taken a big bag of, of sawdust, because you were at, at the mill over in Laramie and you brought that up, and you've tilled it into your soil. Not, you not laid it on top, but you roto-tilled it in. So that's going to add a lot of organic matter for sure. But know that there's a downside to it. Does it matter what type of tree? As far as cedar tree or pine? It's, it, it, it can, and usually it's walnut. Sawdust from walnuts, that's the bigger problem. Because it's more aliopathic. So it has, so that walnut has uh, an acid that it leaches out and that can kill some plants but walnut is really the big one so can you add sugar in two weeks you, you got to feed them with with some more organic material yeah so you're gonna have to bring something back in um leaves um grass clippings pine needles Soybean meal, cotton seed meal, something. Got to put something back into that soil. And it's generally after a couple of weeks. You just have to really monitor it. Be careful. Okay. Yeah. What about sawdust and compost? Do you set similar problems? Yeah. yeah. Yep, for sure. Yep. And in, and in a, a compost bin, you really want that carbon ratio higher than the nitrogen ratio mm -hmm. anyway. So you're always going to be putting something in there, but but you will have that drop. Yeah. Okay. Earthworms. So I, every once in a while that carbon to nitrogen ratio pops in and you really want kind of like a 20 to one, you want the nitrogen low. So one of the problems with compost piles is that they can become smelly. It's because there's too much nitrogen in there, green material, too much kitchen scraps, too much, you know, something. So you want to put some more brown stuff in there. So that's like straw or um, sawdust or something like that. So you want to add more brown. Do you possibly cardboard? Cardboard, can you use cardboard? So cardboard is cardboard is kind of interesting and scary all at the same time because there's a lot of chemicals involved in cardboard. They don't even recommend burning cardboard because there's so much chemicals in there. If you've ever burned cardboard, you notice it gives off kind of like a green. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm always really cautious with cardboard, and if I'm trying to kill off some grass or something. Um, black plastic is better, a bunch of other things are a lot better. So recycle the cardboard. Yeah. Yeah. How about like um, newsprint or like brown paper and like broken sacks? That should be okay. Yeah, that's a whole different process. Yeah. Okay, earthworms. Let me back up. So earthworms, again, this these guys, you want them in your garden. And I'll do yard calls in the summer and I'll get someone that calls and says, my yard is lumpy. Mm -hmm. Or I have, I know I have earthworms. I dug up my part of my lumpy yard. What do I do to kill my earthworms off? And I'm like, I have a whole bunch of master gardeners that'll come over and dig up your lawn and take it, <laughs> take the earthworms. <laughs> so so there is no in, there is no insecticides or poisons to get rid of earthworms. It's not even recommended. People do ask for them. A lumpy lawn is usually a sign of really, really good earthworm activity, and they should be happy, but they're typically not. So earthworms like their soil cool. They're skin breathers, so they they need moist soil. If the soil is dry and barren, you're not going to have earthworms. They need to have that organic matter because they eat all the time, right? I mean, that's their goal in life is to eat. So you got to feed your earthworms. Got to keep that soil moist. I've had someone call and say, yeah, I've got this great compost pile going. And then I threw earthworms in there 
and I'm really going to have the best compost ever. And I'm like, oh, yeah, the earthworms are long gone. <laughs> they, they've, they've left. They've gone for cooler soil. So they'll actually go deep into the earth during the winter and hibernate. And then they come back to the surface when it starts to warm up and gets to their happy temperature. But they'll pull all sorts of stuff down into the soil. And, and then, of course, the castings are just amazing. There's a couple of people who have started businesses with just earthworms. One of them is uh, Erica Babbitt over in Laramie, and she's got a business called the Worm Wrangler. And then there's a guy down in Laporte, and I haven't kept up with him, but John Anderson down there. And he used to show up at the farmer's markets in his wormbulance. <laughs> and he literally bought an old ambulance, changed the name, called it a wormbulance, and sold worm castings and, and worms for your garden all over. <laughs> yeah. He was, he was, he, I had him as a speaker a couple of times. And he was passionate. And he'd roll out a big tarp and, and an earthworm soil, and he'd have us all on our knees looking for earthworm cocoons. So earthworms also produce cocoons that look like little tiny pieces of pasta almost in the in the soil. So they're kind of hard to find, but they're there. And these these guys are are they work for free and they do a lot of good things for your soil. Right? So what was the name of the company, Catherine? So the one in Laramie is. Um, Erica Babbitt with the, and she's the worm wrangler. Okay. And I know, and I know she's actively, you know, working and raising worms. And then there's John Anderson down in the port, but I have, I've kind of lost contact with him. Okay. Yep. <laughs> So after a rainy day, you know, in the summer and it's rained and all the worms come up and they're on the sidewalk. How many of you pick up a worm and put it back in the lawn? I'm, I'm, one, of, I'm one of those people that I have a worm. Yeah, it's like, they're, they're important. Hey, leaves. This just amazes me. People bag up leaves and throw them away every year. This is free fertilizer. Oh my gosh. Um, so the, the joke <laughs> is there's um, <laughs> the day after Thanksgiving, right? You're supposed to put your leaves in bags. If you live in town, you put your leaves in bags and put them on the curb and the city comes around and collects them. Well, the master gardeners have figured this one out. And so they get up a lot earlier than the city workers <laughs> and they were literally driving around and pick up leaves. And then I heard that there were some master gardeners coming all the way down from Buffalo to pick up Cheyenne leaves for their gardens. Yeah. <laughs> but this is leaves are just amazing in the soil. They break down very, very quickly. They're, they then they hand off their nutrients back to the soil very slowly or to the plants. Lots of micronutrients, some macronutrients in it, but it's it's never in big numbers. Phosphorus, potassium, boron, iron, zinc, magnesium. Don't mess, there's no soil. They're, they don't change the salt. They don't change the pH. So they're very benign, but they bring a lot of benefits back to the soil. Organic matter is huge from these guys. I, I used to bring up when my parents lived in Nevada, Colorado, my, my mom practically vacuumed the lawn. And so I'd bring all that stuff, all the bags of leaves and needles. I'd go to the neighbors, I'd get their leaves and needles and bring it all back and incorporate it up into my garden. So this, this is, um, this again is right up there with coffee grounds. And this is something you want to keep, you want to put back into your garden. Most of the master gardeners that live in town save this stuff and they put it back into their own gardens much to the chagrin of the city of Cheyenne because they use it in their compost. Yeah. <laughs> they need to be masturbated. No, nah. I mean, you can. I usually just take it, 
take the leaves out of the bag, just dump it in there, spread them out. I'll let my husband have at it with the rototiller. And if there's a few poking up, who cares? The worms will take it down. Yeah, the stuff just disappears quickly. So biochar, I'm kind of on the fence with this. This is, um, this is green material that has kind of been turned into charcoal and then has been added back to the soil. And it's, they think it helps improve yields. It's good with, it's high potassium. It does have an elevated pH with it. So I'm really kind of on the fence with it. There's a, my counterpart up in Wheatland just loves this stuff and puts it into his garden. And it's like, it's like, well, Leroy, are you checking the pH and the salts? No, I think everything's okay. <laughs> Whatever. Okay, there's that word again, manure. So the big box stores like to sell cow and sheep manure in a bag. If you can smell it, it is not finished composting. <laughs> if it has an odor to it, it's not done. It's still raw stuff in there. And again, that's just not safe to handle. You don't know what the salts are. You don't know what the NPK is. So you, you don't know anything about this. And a little of it goes a long ways. I, I, for a while, I was getting phone calls in the summer about people who have taken you know, mushroom and sheep and cow and big soil, we're putting it all into a into a, a raised bed about the size of these tables. And then they call me and go, everything's died. What, what, what's happened? And, and so now you get to play detective. And I have to ask a lot of questions and you know, come to find out that they've added all this manure, to all this bagged manure. And just because the big box stores is selling it doesn't mean that it's good for you. Good for them, but not good for you. So again, just, just say no to manures because now you guys have got other tools to use. Okay, green manure. This is always one that people go, what? You just told me that I can't use manure in my garden. Now you're telling me to use green manure. So green manure is essentially you have grown something like buckwheat or rye or wheat or oats, and you've let it grow so tall, and then you rototilled it back into the soil. So it's a, it's a sacrificial crop. So you're gonna grow it to a certain point and then you're gonna reincorporate it into the soil. It has a lot of organic material to that soil. So if you've got a heavy clay soil or even a sandy soil, gravelly soil, these guys really help that soil out a lot. There's a lot of wheat growers in this area. You can get wheat just from a bin. Grow it, don't let it go to seed, grow till it in. And it, it does add some nitrogen, some slow release nitrogen, but it really brings in a lot of organic material. So you can see um, dry material over here. And also it can be very high in nitrogen. So again, a little caution on that. Buckwheat grows, germinates pretty quickly, don't let it. Theoretically, don't let it go to seed because you'll never get rid of it. I have not had that problem. Clover, rye, southern peas. A lot of farmers in the area use southern pea as a cover crop and a green manure. So they'll grow it, they'll harvest it, they'll harvest the peas off of it, and then they incorporate all the material back into the soil. Um, vetch, again, vetch is one you don't want to let go to seed. Wheat. Winter wheat, spring wheat, any of that. You can grow it and till it back in before it goes to seed. 
So you can add a lot of organic material really quickly and a slow release nitrogen. So this kind of is a kind of a geeky chart on how many pounds of nitrogen per acre. So we always look at everything per acre. So you have to kind of break it down. But the vetch is going to be the one that brings the most amount of nitrogen back to that soil. But again, huge organic material. Okay, composting. Okay. One of the big problems I run into with people who are trying to do composting is they don't they don't add water. Water is the most important element to bring into composting. You don't want it like soggy. You want it like a sponge, like a, like a damp sponge. And then you turn it. It needs to be turned. So like once a week, you're going to go out there, you're going to have several bins. And there's quite a few master gardeners that have really elevated this to quite the art and science. So you start off with all your raw stuff. And you take it and you turn it and you put it into this bin and you add water. But you're stirring it, right? You take it from here to there and you stir it. And you take it from there to here and you're stirring it again and you're adding more water. It should only take you like a couple months to get to this point. If you're if you're telling me that oh it's sitting there for a year, you're not stirring it and you're not adding water. So two, one, the most important thing is that water, but stirring it to get the air into there again. The air is going to help speed up that decomposition. The water is feeding all those microorganisms, getting things to kick off. If it's and it should be like 20 to one carbon to nitrogen or brown, green. So on the brown stuff that, you know, leaves, grass, um, leaves, grass clippings are gonna be more on the green end of things. Um, Kitchen waste, and if you don't want to do cold composting, but you have a regular composting bins, three of them work best. I used to just take chicken wire and make a big circle and then and then do um, black plastic, and I'd fill that. Then I'd lift it, dump everything out, turn it, add some water, put it back, take all that stuff and throw it back in there. And then a week later, I'd do it again. And about three months later, depending upon how dedicated I was to it, I'd, I'd have something, your compost should smell earthy. And you shouldn't find any of the original material in there. You shouldn't find a banana peel or an orange peel. You shouldn't find any of that. It should all be broken down. It should be kind of a nice kind of black to brown color, but it should smell really earthy and nice. It shouldn't have an odor to it. Trying to find the dry ingredients, the brown stuff can be a little hard to find sometimes. Straw works really well. To be able to go to a feed store and find straw or, straw is actually getting hard to find in small bales. Normally it's like, I, I've i just bought six brown bales of straw and they're 1,400 pounds each. That's a lot, yeah, that's a lot. The whole class could share that bale. <laughs> So and you can get it, but you just have to look a little bit to find small square bales. Um, so some things you don't want to throw in there, meat and dairy products, just because they mold and, and they can get smelly and they can bring some stuff to that that you don't want. Colored paper, the, the inks on that are not user-friendly. Cardboard is got just a lot of chemicals in there. Again, charcoal, fireplace ash. You don't want to put any of that stuff in there because again, that 
it's, it messes with the soil with a pH in there. Um, and then if you, if you absolutely going, Catherine's crazy about manure, I'm still going to add it because that's what my grandpa and my uncle and whatever has always used. Be really careful with where you source it. If, if those cattle have been out on the field grazing and that rancher has been putting grazon or tordon down as a herbicide, and that animal eats that herbicide, that plant with the herbicide on it, that passes through and it stays in the manure. It doesn't hurt the animal, but now it's passed through and it's in the manure. Cordon, grazon, um, has a half-life of three years. So that if there's an herbicide now in your vegetable garden that's got a half-life of three years. Ooh, it's a hard one to get around. You're not gonna get that out. That's the very persistent, highly soluble, means it can go into the um, water, water source. Um, so a lot of herbicides, be careful with that. And then um, there are some feedlots in Laramie County and that is just gonna be really, really salty. Really, really salty. So you've gotta be careful with that. You don't know what the MPK is, but I guarantee you the salts are gonna be off the charts. And yeah, just caution. Um, so how to build a compost pile, how big should it be? Well, as, it should be as big as it is easy for you to work with. So I have it, my husband's an engineer and he'd build something that would be ginormous because <laughs> he's an engineer. But you've got to have something that fits in your yard, easy to work with, and on my comp, I have a big compost pile and the top is rounded. And, you know, they're saying it should be flat with a slight depression just to catch the rainwater. Well, after my dogs get done laying on top of it because it's warm, then I end up with a depression in it. <laughs> yeah. Keep it moist, but not wet. Um, should start to heat up pretty quickly, two to three days. And it should get hot enough that in the winter, you should see steam coming off of it at night. <clears throat> About 10 days, keep turning it, keep adding water to it. And of course the carbon and nitrogen ratio really should be like two to one. So, or uh, 30 to one, 20 to one is, is pretty typical what we're gonna get here. And again, it should smell nice. It should smell earthy. You're gonna to wanna to use a half inch to a quarter inch, spread it out, rototill it in. And it, it does do a lot of really nice things for your vegetable garden or your flower bed or your roses. You can top dress your lawn with it, use it as kind of a lawn fertilizer in the spring. So it, it really does bring a lot to the program if you wanna to go to that kind of work. speak a little bit to the variation in the um, ratios for compost because I've heard a lot of different ratios. Yeah, 20 to 1, 30 to 1 is kind of where you want to be, but you really want that carbon higher, which is the brown stuff. Because when that nitrogen starts getting higher, and you'll know it because it'll smell, the compost pile will smell. And you mentioned something about it being 20 to 1, 20 to 1 would be good for this area. Is there a particular reason for that? Just we're dry, so dry. dry and windy here. It's really hard to keep those compost piles moist. And you really have to be dedicated. Middle of the winter, you're going out there. It hasn't snowed in a while, and it's starting to dry out. You're going to have to water it. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's fun. Okay, compost tea. I don't hear as much about this as I used to. But compost tea for a while, this was a doctor um, from Dr. Lane Ng, and, and so it was pretty popular for quite a while. And people were selling it for farmers to use on their farm fields. We've used it. Um, you can make it. It's, it's not as simple as just soaking 
compost in a bucket, you have to aerate it and it has to be aerated vigorously. And the class that I took from Dr. Lane Young, she talked about people using hot tubs and turning it on high or using a washing, an old washing machine and just keeping it on that high agitation level and agitating it for like 12 hours to get a good compost tea because you're trying to balance out that, that fungi and bacteria. And, and again, if this smells, then it's anaerobic. And now you've got, now you've got the bad boys at the party. Now, the uh, Hells Angels just rode in and they're in your compost tea. Look at it that way. <laughs> so you, you don't, it shouldn't smell. If it does smell, it's anaerobic. It's bad bacteria in there. So it's um, it's it's not a fertilizer, it's not a herbicide, it's not a fungicide, but it helps all those microorganisms do their job. It brings more of more of the good guys in, and it just helps them, helps the plant. Okay. Same philosophy for comfrey tea. What's that? Comfrey. Comfrey. Comfort tea. Yeah, I there's some master gardeners that do that, make comfort tea and, and put it on their plants. Oh yeah, it really should. And that's not quite as, as finicky because you're not putting in, you're not trying to have the good bacteria outnumber the bad bacteria, but it should still be aerated. And even if you just use like an air aerating pump for a fish tank. That should work. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought that Myco, everybody's talking about that. Yeah. Well, a little bit. Myco should be like Mycocaresia. So it's a fungus. You're putting down a good fungus. Good for trees. You know, if you're planting a tree, that's what I would put in there. And I used it for a while. There was a, a nursery here that was selling Mycocaresia in a little tub. Mm -hmm. And they went out of business. And I got all their tubs of microcreasy, which was enough for everyone in the class and then enough for master gardener meeting. And then I still had quite a bit and I was mixing it. I make my own seed starter soil. So I was putting that in my seed starter soil and I was having a lot better germination and growth with it in there. Yeah. So you said, you said the compost pile should be smaller than a PBMR. Or is that just when that seems big for a living town type of that small yeah. lot? Oh, I I've seen compost piles that were like three of these tables in the backyard, and, and they just kept rotating it. And I had one master gardener who's really doing the good work with it, so they were quite elegant. Yeah. <laughs> they were really elegant. But I've seen pallets. Mm -hmm. You know, a bunch of pallets all put together. That's that's a good size, but it's whatever size is good for you to work with. But if it's too small, they're not going to work. Plus, why is that? Because they're just not going to get hot enough. They don't have that mass. And that heat is really important. You know, ideally, in a compost pile, you get it to 140 degrees. Really hard to do in a compost pile. It's too small. Really hard. So there's a dairy. There's Barnett Dairy. In the very southeast corner of the county, at County Road 203 and like 150, and they compost all their dairy manure and all the all the bedding, and it's a huge operation. It's huge, and they get it up to 140 degrees. And so the operator will have a big a big long thermometer and we probe it, and it's I mean, it's too hot to keep your hand on. But that 140 degrees is. This is what we call thermal death for bacteria and bad bacteria and hopefully things like E. coli because it's a dairy farm. And so now you're talking listeria, but it also is hot enough to kill weed seeds. So that's why that 140 degrees is, is what you want to target. And again, that's that's the it's called the thermal death. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's there's a point where you kill everything off. Yeah. So insects, um 140 degrees is still a thermal death for insects. Gator, 
company here in China. Um, they used to make, I don't know if they're still making it, but they did the wiring harness to make for um, containers that reached 140 degrees for people who traveled overseas to put their suitcase in there to kill off bed bugs. Oh, just saying, 140 degrees to kill a bed bug. Or Wyoming winter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're a tropical insect. They don't like the winter. Okay, mulching, especially for flower gardens, trees, helps hold the water in, controls weeds, moderates the soil temperature, which can be pretty important in the winter when it's bare soil, that soil temperature is going up and down and so it fluctuates a lot. So mulches help moderate that. And a mulch can be, be a lot of different things. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of rocks because I think rocks really kind of pack the soil. And rocks can be hotter in the summer and colder in the winter type environment. Unfortunately, they're used a lot. Mm -hmm. Grass clipping, shredded leaves, crushed corn cobs, pine needles. Pine needles, again, really awesome mulch to use. Wood chips, another good one. They make that gorilla hair so that it all kind of holds together. There's um, over in Laporte, there's a place where they do the um, the timber for log cabins and so they peel all that so you can get old peelings that holds together doesn't blow away I mean that's always in our minds right we live in Wyoming it's like well it's going to blow away right so what you have is not going to blow away besides rocks my uh, <laughs> son said use either angel hair style mulch because it also helps keep the moisture in mm -hmm. um, they haven't had too many problems with bugs. We bought that and it really is helpful. Yeah, so it, um, a good mulch will help your trees, helps your trees a lot, hold the soil moisture in, don't dry out as fast. Same thing in your flower beds, really helps hold that moisture in. So it's more efficient use of water. I will mulch in my vegetable garden if I've got um, straw. I'll use that to help hold moisture in. Suppresses weeds because I don't like to pull weeds any more than the next person does. Uh, you can use newspaper. You put newspaper down and use that and then put something on top of it. That works. Landscape fabric. I just uh, was down in Palm Springs, California, visiting my brother. They really believe in, in the ground rock finds for mulch. And it just, it looks nice, doesn't blow away. They don't have much wind down there. So they have a different version of mulch. What you don't want to do to your trees is the volcano approach. Because when you mulch a tree, you're not trying to mulch the stem, the trunk. In fact, that's pretty detrimental to the tree. You're trying to mulch the root area and keep the moisture in the root area. So when you mulch up against the stem, like up in that picture, you're holding moisture in along the trunk and you really want air circulation along the trunk so that you don't end up with fungal problems or insects living in there. So you don't want to mulch the trunk, you're mulching the, the roots, very over the roots. Okay. Diseases and pest control. So again, I, I like to take this more holistic approach to managing problems and issues in the landscape. And I really wanna keep the hard chemicals out because just because you can buy it at Walmart doesn't mean it's safe. And usually when I see an insect problem, it, Insects are usually secondary or tertiary. They're ne almost never the primary problem. There's something else going on with that plant that's bringing in the bugs. <clears throat> Use disease resistant veggies, perennials, trees. You know, they'll tell you on the label or in the nursery, they'll tell you, or the, the catalog will tell you if it's disease resistant. Mulching. For trees, young trees, really important. 
water, how you water, when you water, um, trees. So trees, the biggest problem I see with our trees in Cheyenne is water. And I know we're in a drought, we're always in a drought, we're never out of a drought. Some years are better than others, right? So one inch of trunk diameter, trunk diameter equals 10 gallons of water. Ideally in a perfect world, a week. So you measure this from the ground up. So there's your tree, ground up 12 inches. So the line. So that means that this diameter, if this diameter is 10 inches, that's 100 gallons of water per week. This is the biggest stressor I see on trees. It's not enough water. If it's in the lawn situation, it's getting some water and it's helping the tree for sure, but it's really creating very shallow roots. And so if you can go out there at least once a month and drop the hose and just soak the whole area so that it gets a good deep drink and it helps those roots go deeper, that's gonna help them. But this is kind of the rule of thumb, working with the city forester, Mark Ellison, and conservation district is, is kind of what everyone is agreeing on. Amount of water, that's, that's a lot of water per tree, especially if you've got your own forest. You can't really afford to do that. You know, there's not enough water in those wells or, or your city water bill will be breathtaking. <laughs> yeah. But if you, can, if you can remember to give your trees more water than what the lawn is getting, this is really gonna help those trees out a lot. Yeah. Should we be giving them that much water in the winter time too? You have to ground so that that's where it gets tricky because you know tree roots don't go dormant they're active year round so if you can get out there at least once a month and give them a drink that really helps you know unless there's more snow or the soil is already wet but yeah, yeah. And, and this year we've been kind of blessed you know with some moisture so, so you do that one shot like a hundred gallon I don't, know, I don't know how I keep a hundred gallons near the tree. So you can use a product called Revive. And Revive is a soil surfactant. It helps break that water soil surface tension and it allows the water to penetrate the soil more efficiently and not let it run off. Depending upon what subdivision you live in or where in the county you live in, the bottle says once a month. If you live in the point, you need to do it like once a week. Okay. You, you have very, very challenging soils in the point. Very challenging. And you're on a, a heavy clay. And so it, it. I've been doing it monthly. You say you should be doing it weekly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I use Revive for my trees. I'm out in the county, but I'm on sandy soil. And so the soil has tended to be a little hydrophobic. So it beads up and it runs off that way. <clears throat> so if I use Revive on it, then I can get that water to penetrate that soil and go deep. You can use it in vegetable gardens, flowers, trees, lawns. <clears throat> spray and do the heavy water after you spray. Yeah. It also is in pellets. Yeah, it does come in granulars. granulars. So you can you can put that down too. Um, I, I'm just enough of a landscape micromanager that you know I want to be there when I'm doing it, and I assume that it's doing its job. So yeah, but, but 
The other problem I run into um, is people like to overlove over -love <laughs> their plants. And so that's what that box of miracle Grow is for, right? Overloving your plants. And that, that is a sure way to bring in pests, insect pests, because it's too much nitrogen and it's the wrong nitrogen. And it just is like putting out a big sign that says, free buffet, all you can eat, come here. So you really have to be very careful with how you feed or fertilize your plants. And so I'm, I'm taking miracle Grow away from you, but I'm giving you things that are a lot more benign and, and natural to use. Yeah. On um, that, the good sanitation part, where it says don't do the last year's debris to overwinter a garden. So are you saying that like at the end of the season, to pull up all the dead stuff, can you put that in your compost? Yeah, or do you just get rid of it? If it wasn't diseased in the first place, we didn't have bugs or no. the powdery mildew. Powdery mildew that doesn't go in the compost. Yeah, I wouldn't put okay. it in the compost. But you don't, because then earlier you were talking about using like the cover crops mm -hmm. to, would like, you just put that down in its place to kind of hold the nutrients of the soil so it doesn't go away? Sure. So you can. In your vegetable garden, you can take, you know, I encourage you to take all the old debris out. Okay. You know, if you've got the time and you can do it. Take it out, go back in and then plant something like winter wheat, mm -hmm. which is a winter annual, likes it cold. Plant that, plant that in um, end of September, first part of October. You need to get it up. It should be about this tall before it goes in the winter. Mm -hmm. And then come spring, it'll jump up and grow. Grow it so it'll land and then plant your garden. Mm -hmm. So don't touch them. You have to be gluten free. And I have to be careful and like say my oats because they trust the gluten and open it heels and that kind of stuff. So with the wheat in my yard per se, the like our front yard, I know it's not our, it, yeah, there was a pollinator garden in the front. And when we moved in our house, no, like us and the previous owner, nobody did anything to grow in the front yard. Well, we may or may not have gotten wheat rabbits and planted clover in our entire front yard and it completely transformed the soil in our entire yeah. front yard. Mm -hmm. So we, we could do that in our back. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so the okay. clover brought a lot of nitrogen in and allowed those, those plants to actually have something to grow with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So now in my pollinator gardens, though, I leave them until the temperature is in the 50s in this 50s average, right, in the spring, because there's a lot of seed and things like that for the birds and their own insect, places for the insects to overwinter. So that's you're, you're growing flowers. Growing vegetables. So, two different situations. And so, the pollinator garden is going to be okay. And you actually want to leave that debris there because, you know, there's other little insects that are beneficial living in that. A vegetable garden, on the other hand, has a tendency to bring in the bad boys. And a lot of times, if you leave that debris in a vegetable garden, there's this, this fly that looks just like every other fly. But it lays these eggs that turn into the seed corn maggot. And so just as your green beans get to germinate and they, they get that hook stage, this maggot comes along and eats it off and you get to start all over it. So that's leaving debris in the garden attracts that bad boy. And so a vegetable garden is going to be a completely different creature than a pollinated garden. Yeah. Okay. Um, good bugs. These guys you can all buy. You can go online and they will ship these insects to you. So you can buy ladybugs, green lace wings, big eyed bug, big eyed bug right there, prey mantis, very cool. <laughs> For anyone who's had an encounter with a praying mantis, they are very 
very cool in a creepy way. You know, anything that can rotate its head and look at you, you know, right? I went to my garden one day and I have I had cosmos growing and I had a praying mantis on my shoulder. And I'm like going, Martin, look, look, honey, look at look at what's on my shoulder. <laughs> He's like, an engineer, you know, it's not mechanical. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Safer soap. This, I've used this off label for fungus and it works pretty good. House plants, um, there's ivies that get fungus. That works pretty good on it. I don't know how well it would work on pine trees for suppressing the uh, the needle cast fungus, but um, you can try. You can make your own fung uh, fungicide. That's uh, two tablespoons of baking soda and a gallon of water with a couple drops of liquid soap. You can spray it on there. If it's suppressant, then you can't for fungus. Bacillus thuringiensis (BT). It comes in a whole bunch of different flavors, but this is a natural bacteria that goes after very specific bugs. Fungus gnats, black flies, mosquitoes, some caterpillars, larva, the looper that likes to get on your cabbage and water tunnels. BT is a good source. Diatomaceous earth, um, you should be able to find, find it with like egg penity and eaten, but diatomaceous earth is the skeletonized remains of diatoms. So when you look at it under a microscope, it's like broken glass and it needs to be on a soft bodied insect that's not slimy. So like aphids, as they crawl across it, it, it right, abrades their body and they just sort of leak out. Doesn't do anything for slugs. They're slimy. They just slime across it. But for soft bodied insects that aren't slimy, this is really good. You can make your own plant based insecticides, chrysanthemums, anything in the um, that family, tobacco products. That works. Some of the most vicious insecticides out there are made from tobacco. Flowers, just planting flowers, trap crops. I'm a big believer in trap crops. So that means I'm going to plant something sacrificial over here, like mustard greens. Unless you're from the South and you think a mess of greens is really a good thing. <laughs> but you can plant mustard greens and have your bad bugs go over to the mustard greens and hang out there and leave your squash alone. So you can do a lot of things to kind of help nature. You can plant a pollinator garden, which brings in the good beneficial insects, and they in turn will go after the bad bugs. So a pollinator garden next to your vegetable garden or your other flowers will really be helpful. Plus you need, a plus you need flowers around a vegetable garden to bring in the pollinators to pollinate your vegetable garden, right? Hmm. When you say sinker soap, is that something like Dr. Donner's or Castile soap? No, it's actually a real product. There should be an R Whoa. registered trademark after okay. that. But it's a it's a real product. Okay. Yep. It's a it's a fatty acid of a soap. Yeah, I know. I know you're gonna go, don't don't go there. <laughs> um, garlic, the organic crop people use a lot of organic like garlic. Use a lot of garlic, and it can act as it acts mostly as a um, repellent. It can, in some instances, um, actually kill the insect. But a lot of the organic sunflower seed production, they use garlic products. Flower ants and flower um, ants are all celiacs, <laughs> so um, so you can put flour down. You can, you can make it entertaining. You can put some cinnamon in there. Mm -hmm. Cinnamon in a concentration is a cinnamon formaldehyde, type of a cinnamon formaldehyde. Mm -hmm. And in high concentration, cinnamon can be an insecticide. 
Mm -hmm. Not sure. I, I know that'll take out take out ants. Cinnamon, you can mix cinnamon and some flour together, a little bit of sugar to pull them and put it down and take out ants. I like to just use equal. The whole packet of equal works really well. Yeah. Okay, pheromone traps. If you're growing apples, pheromone traps are the way to go. You know, every spring I have someone call me and go, what can I spray my apple trees with so I don't have wormy apples? And it's like nothing. You can't spray those apple trees because they're blooming. And if you spray them when they're blooming, you're going to kill your bees. And then you're not going to have any apples. Yep. So they make pheromone traps. They will come as a little tent. Sometimes they're a little sticky, brown sticky, red things. <laughs> Did one yard call where a guy made his own sticky traps. Took Christmas ornaments and put Tanglefoot on and hung them in this tree. <laughs> they, they work. They were catching all sorts of stuff. So you can make your own. You can buy pheromone traps. Um, Gardens Alive. Uh, there's uh, a couple others where you can buy them online, pheromone traps, especially for your apples for coddling moth. Sticky traps, yellow sticky traps. Those are amazing. Absolutely amazing. And those are, they're yellow and they have Tanglefoot on them. And there's a lot of insects that are drawn to the color of yellow. So if you have fungus gnats in your house plants, back off the water because they're feeding on the algae. The, the adult fungal gnats are going to fly right to that sticky trap and they're going to get stuck on it. And you might be really amazed at how many fungus gnats all of a sudden appear. But that's another <clears throat> non chemical way to control these bugs. Um, yellow, yellow jacket traps need to be put out in April. Okay. So most of the time we put them out way too late. It's, we put them out when we start to see them. It's too late. You got to put them out in April when the queen is flying. You want to catch that queen and get her eliminated. We do have some native yellow jackets, but we also have the European paper wasp. And so this is the one you really want to catch. And so this is, you put this out in April. April, yep. Where do you find this? I'll go to the farm store. Okay. Go to a farm store. Murdoch's, Tractor Supply, online, yeah. Amazon. Uh, Amazon. Yeah. Right. Boric acid, borates, borax, 20 team borax. There's an insecticide right there. That'll take care of your ants. A few other things that crawl around on the ground, but perennial team borax works really well. That won't do anything here. So, well, you're not putting enough on the soil to cause problems. This is usually like around the house, you know, the foundation of your house or in in a damp area where you're having some ant some problems. But you don't sprinkle it out on the whole lawn. You're just going to put it as more of a defensive barrier. Yeah. Again, ants get it on themselves and they, they're groomers, so they'll groom it off and then they end up eating it and it kills them. But with ants, you always want to take out the queen. Kill the queen, you've killed that, that ant nest. You're just spraying stuff on the surface and you're taking off the workers. She's going to make more workers. Fred didn't come home. We're going to make 10 more Freds. <laughs> yeah. but, but some ants eat termites, and we have the subterranean termites in this climate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not a lot of problems. You know. Yeah, not a lot of problems. I, I'm rare that I hear problems with those guys. Really rare. Yeah, or you have to make sure you don't like the pets get near it. Pets aren't going to mess with it. It's, yeah. it's the, I saw one where they mixed borax and sugar for the ants. I guess they got one in the wood and that's where they put it down. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> you can mix borax with some sugar again to, to take out your ants. I thought, I think it would be really unusual for a pet to go after it, unless it's just a really curious dog mm -hmm. that's got to eat everything. Yeah, I know. I just described on one dog. Yeah. 
<laughs> horticulture oils. So this, this is usually a petroleum, a really finely milled petroleum product. And it's used a lot for scale. So save yourself a lot of money. Go buy some baby oil and pour some baby oil on a sponge and just sponge it on the scale insects that are on your aspen trees. Or just take some, um, some soap and make it a, a thin solution of soap and just put that soapy sponge on the aspen tree with the scale. Baby oil. Go to the dollar store and get some baby oil and do that. Get that. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of easier ways. Neem oil, that's an azadactrin, indica. That is non-selective and that will take anything out. It, it doesn't care if it's good bug or bad bug. Neem oil is not selective. It's used a lot in the uh, organic cropping productions. Um, vinegar for weed control, 5% vinegar, don't dilute it. Hottest part of the day, go out and put it on your on the weeds in your driveway or your um, thistle. Spray it on your thistle, knock down the thistle. It doesn't kill the thistle, but it knocks it down. So you just repeat your harass. You harass thistle enough, it will go away. It'll die out. So instead of grabbing the Roundup, go get a bottle of vinegar and just put the vinegar straight. Don't dilute it right on those weeds that are in the sidewalks or the driveway. And, and that'll take them out. Just vinegar. You have to, so a lot of these weeds that are deep rooted, like bindweed and thistle and Dalmatian toad flax, they're perennials. It's persistence. You have to you have to harass them constantly. Persistence. That's that's what's going to take them out. It's the same with the first age. Oh, <laughs> so skeleton leaf burr sage. Persistence, just persistence. And that's, that doesn't, it's not deep rooted, but it's just this, it's like bindweed. And it's, God, his cousin is bindweed. So it's just persistence. And my dog gives it a tail and brings it inside everywhere. <laughs> you can mow it, you can pull it. Um, Roundup doesn't really touch it. So it's just persistence. Just persistence. I, I was reading that the blind weed seed lasts 60 years. Yeah, I'm not surprised. The, right up there at cheek risk. Yeah. Okay, so so before you all run off, just because I don't know what the weather is going to do. So I don't know what the rain is going to do, and I don't, I don't want you guys to try and to get too uncomfortable with because I do have some people here from California. <laughs> I want you to grab a Johnny C catalog because that's what I'm going to teach out of the everybody would grab a Johnny. <laughs>
Thank you so much. Yeah, everybody, thank you for welcome. You're 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 Shut this down.